Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. The commission room is ready for you to begin. All right. <clears throat> well, I have convened the June 18, 19, 2020 meeting of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. So will the recording secretary please call roll. Kristen Barnes. Here. Catherine Woodens Brown. Here. C. Michael Cooney. If I turn off your audio. Okay. C. Michael Cooney. Here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Marisol Delatore Escobedo. Here. Anna Marie Francois. Present. Makita Gwino Shire. Present. Johanna Hawick. Present. Alicia Hahn. Present. Terry Jackson. Here. Bonnie Clatt. Kevin Quinn. Jane Marks. Here. Cynthia Martin. Here. Monica Martinez. Monica Martinez. Ade Rodriguez. Here. David Simmons. Here. Tina Sloan. Here. Andrew Wall. Here. We have a con. Thank you. Executive Director Sandy, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, Madam Chair. I'm going to switch my, my video to a flag. Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me okay? If you give me a thumbs up, that it's okay. All right, good. I'd like to take a few minutes to remind everyone about the meeting process before we get to today's agenda. Because many of us are working remotely, this meeting is again being conducted via Zoom. Staff is maintaining a minimal presence in the commission building, but everyone else is participating from their own locale. Microphones, we'd like you to know that everyone's microphone is muted to eliminate any background noise that may hinder others from hearing what is being said. Commissioners and presenters can unmute yourself, but please mute your microphone after you're done speaking. Zoom identification. We'd like to ask that everyone check their Zoom identification and make sure it contains your first and last name accurately. This is very important for those who want to make public comments so that we are able to call on you appropriately and also so that we can get all names accurately recorded in the record. Commenting or asking questions. Commissioners, some of you may be using the video audio functions and some of you will be using audio only. Commissioners that would like to speak, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. I do have your whole list here. Sometimes though, I've got to scroll back and forth through it, even though I have a big screen to make sure I see you. So if I do miss you, uh, then you will just need to unmute and please uh, speak up. Motions and roll, roll call vote. Because this is a teleconferencing meeting, we need to conduct each vote by roll call. This is going to take a little time. Please bear with us. Just before the vote, we will remind everyone to make sure you are unmuted so that we don't miss anyone's vote. Public comment. There is a time designated for public comment. If you wish to speak on a specific item, please email your request to comments at CTC dot ca dot gov or you may call the following number 916-322-6253 and indicate which item you wish to speak to so we can make sure to call on you at the appropriate time please make sure the request includes your full name your phone number if participating through phone only your affiliation and the agenda number and title Make sure the name you provide matches the name used to join the meeting. 
The meeting host will call your name and unmute your microphone to allow you to share your comment during the public comment period. After you finish your comment, your microphone will be muted by the meeting host. Each of our committee chairs will have the discretion to set a time limit on comments, depending on the volume of speakers seeking to speak on a particular item. We ask that you keep your remarks brief and focused on the particular, sorry, item you're speaking to. You will get a one minute warning and will be asked to finish your sentence before being muted by the meeting host. Recording. Also, just like an in-person meeting, this meeting is being recorded. After the meeting, the archived audio and video will be available via the Commission's website. Next, I regret to announce that Kathleen Allaby has stepped down from the Commission. I'd like to share the following message that Executive Director Sandy and I received from Kathleen. The Commission on Teacher Credentialing is an outstanding collection of people doing valuable work for the betterment of our state, our teachers, and ultimately the children of California. I thank you for the opportunity to sit on this prestigious panel for the past two years. It has been an education for me, and I hope I have added a unique school district perspective during my tenure. My local situation has radically changed with the coronavirus restrictions. As president of my school board and with the looming issues facing my district, I feel that my focus needs to be here in my community. I will be dealing with many of the same problems you will, such as severe financial implications and the delivery of services as we return to a more normal schedule. I value the work the commission does, but given the need to give my total effort to my district, I must redirect my time. Please extend my best wishes to the entire commission as they continue to do the good work of preparing our future teachers for a monumental career. Half of the commission, I'd like to thank Kathleen for her service and wish her well as she navigates the COVID-19 situation with her school district. Give her. Okay. That, uh, item 1A is the approval of the April 2020 minutes. We will need to make two separate motions to approve the ad hoc committee and regular session minutes. I'd like to remind everyone that only those who served on the speech committee can make and second the motion to approve the committee minutes. Ad hoc committee members are Jaide Rodriguez, Marisol de la Torre Escobedo, and Monica Martinez. Do I have a motion from a member of the ad hoc committee to approve the April 2020 ad hoc committee minutes? So moved by uh -huh. Thank you, Commissioner Rodriguez. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner De La Torre Escobedo. Discussion? All right. Will the recording secretary call for the vote? Marisol De La Torre Escobedo. Aye. Monica Martinez. Ade Rodriguez? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Next, do I have a motion to approve the April 2020 minutes? Uh, Commissioner Cooney? You are muted. Approve the minutes as presented. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second. Commissioner Barnes. Seconded by Commissioner Barnes. Discussion? All right, will the recording secretary call for a vote? Kirsten Barnes. Aye. C. Michael Cooney. Aye. Marisol De La Torre Escobedo. Aye. Johanna Hawick. Aye. Alicia Hine. Aye. Perry Jackson. Perry Jackson. Aye. Kevin Quinn. Aye. Jane Marks. Aye. Cynthia Martin. Aye. 
Monica Martinez. Ade Rodriguez. Aye. David Simmons. Aye. Tina Sloan. Aye. Motion carries. The next item is 1B, approval of the June 2020 agenda. We have an agenda insert for item 6B. Item 2E will be presented tomorrow. Do I have a motion to approve the June 2020 agenda? I have my uh, raise hand panel over here. Anyone can raise a hand. Commissioner Cooney? You're muted. <laughs> uh, so seldom muted, it's, uh, it's not normal. I move approval of the agenda as uh, modified. Okay, and do I have a second? Second. Commissioner Hines seconded. Discussion? All right. Uh, will the recording secretary call for a vote? Kirsten Barnes? Aye. C. Michael Cooney? Aye. Marisol De La Torre Escobedo? Aye. Johanna Howick? Aye. Alicia Hahn? Aye. Perry Jackson? Aye. Kevin Quinn? Aye. Jean Marks? Aye. Cynthia Martin? Aye. Monica Martinez? Ade Rodriguez? Aye. David Simmons? Aye. Tina Sloan? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Agenda item 1C is approval of the June 2020 consent calendar. Do commissions have any items they would like to consider in closed session? If you do, just use your raise hand feature. I will call on each of you. Commissioner Rodriguez. Yes, I would like to um, pull Oscar O. Mendes to consider in closed session, please. Thank you. Any other commissioners? All right. Seeing none, do I have a motion to approve all remaining items on the consent calendar? Commissioner Cooney, you're using your raise hand feature quite well today. Thank you. I'm getting used to being unmuted too. Uh, <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, I will approve the consent calendar. Um, the remaining consent calendar with the removal of uh, Oscar Mendez to closed session. Thank you. I have a, a motion by Commissioner Cooney. Do I have a second? Commissioner Marks. I second. Thank you. Will the recording secretary call for the vote? Kirsten Barnes? Aye. C. Michael Cooney? Aye. Marisol De La Torre Escobedo? Aye. Johanna Howick? Aye. Alicia Hine? Aye. Perry Jackson? Aye. Bonnie Clark? Oh, Kevin Quinn? Aye. Jean Marks? Aye. Cynthia Martin? Aye. Monica Martinez? Ade Rodriguez? Aye. David Simmons? Aye. Tina Sloan? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Agenda item 1D is the chair's report. Earlier in the week, uh, Executive Director Mary Sandy and I uh, sent a letter to uh, our education community and to all of you. And uh, I'd like to read it now so that it becomes part of the record. 
Um, letter dated June 16th, open letter to the education community. A quote from Justice Thurgood Marshall. I wish I could say that racism and prejudice were only distant memories. We must dissent from the indifference. We must dissent from the apathy. We must dissent from the fear, the hatred, and the mistrust. We must dissent because America can do better, because America has no choice but to do better. As we witness and share in the collective mourning for lost Black lives and the demands for justice for victims like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Aubrey, we are sad and outraged and ashamed. But we also see growing societal awareness of the devastating impacts of institutional racism on Black Americans and the unforgivable inequities that people of color face in our country. This moment demands action from every person and every sector of society. It is especially salient to how we educate young people. This raises many questions for us. What role can educators play in dismantling systemic institutional racism? What role do they play in perpetuating these systems? What does anti-racist education look like and how do we get there? How can the Commission on Teacher Credentialing through its policy standards and engagement within the field of education be a catalyst for change? We must first embrace the notion that we all have much to learn and unlearn. This will require our own commitment to participate, read, process, part uh, watch, listen, and tolerate some level of discomfort as we develop our understanding of racism in American culture. It will also require direct engagement with students, teachers, administrators, counselors, parents and white communities and communities of color. Second, we must examine the current policy standards and practices we employ that enable and constrain the recruitment, preparation and credentialing of a diverse and highly effective education workforce. We need to ensure this workforce is prepared to engage in practice that is anti-racist, asset-based, culturally responsive, and addresses implicit and explicit bias. We know our policies must be grounded in a clear and shared vision of student success and well-being in school. And perhaps this is where we start. Third, we need to work collaboratively with the education preparation community to develop a deep and collective understanding of how to prepare highly effective members of the education workforce in these critical aspects of ed ed sorry, equitable practice. How we go about enacting our equity work will be the subject of this commission meeting, future commission conversations, and a strategic planning process that began prior to interruption of COVID-19. In closing, we borrow these sage words from the staff at Teaching Tolerance who have inspired us with their own process. Here's what they have to say. There will be time for takeaways. In the coming weeks and months, our questions will shift toward analysis. We'll concretely and consistently recognize the depth of the history that informs this moment and the diverse range of lived experiences that share the streets. We'll turn to vital questions about educational spaces and their relationship to systemic racist violence. We'll continue to look at our institutions and consider how they might better serve all people. We'll continue to think critically about the role educators can play in imagining a liberatory future for all. Sincerely, Tina Sloan and Mary Vixie Sandy. This is a letter from Tina and Mary um, expressing our thoughts, our views, our hopes, but um, what we do in the commission is shaped by all of us. When I accepted your nomination and vote uh, to become chair of the commission, I did so because I was hopeful for the future of educating our children. Our economic outlook at the time was brightening for the first time in decades, and we had a good foundation of work to build on. We had new leaders entering office with tremendous expertise and commitment to children in school. Governor Gavin Newsom, Superintendent Tony Thurman, State Board President Linda Darling-Hammond, to name a few. They've all shown remarkable leadership during COVID-19 and during our national condemnation of police brutality and calls for racial justice and education justice. And now we're all engaging in that moment and momentum is building all around us. 
sometimes I feel like we can only do so much at CTC to make schools a better place for children and families and educators, because we only have purview over limited parts. But in this moment, we have partners from across our agencies and schools and stakeholders holders and programs all taking action in similar ways that Mary and considering for our work here. We have an opportunity more than ever to work across these sectors, hand in hand, to protest, to heal, and to do something that really does move the needle on equity, that really does make educational opportunity accessible for all students, that really does open the profession to people from all races and backgrounds. We here are a community of people, commissioners, staff, stakeholders, doing this work, informing our work. Commissioners, you're here because you each bring an expertise to this community that makes our collective decision-making better. I was reflecting this morning on the term commissioner reports. It all sounds so very official. And whenever it was time <clears throat> for these reports for all those years I sat at the table, I uh, rarely said anything because I didn't think I had any official commission business to report on. But I think commission reports should also be about informing each other about our professional spaces, what you're experiencing there, your thoughts about that, because that's why you're here. It informs the rest of us, no matter how trivial you wonder it is. I've never heard a trivial word at this table. So from here on out, I hope that you will treat commissioner reports, agenda items, our future strategic planning sessions as a place to voice your thoughts no matter how half-baked, you've heard me, I'm always spouting half-baked ideas, but they get better when I put them out there and you all help me shape them. I need you and our community more than ever to help me shape new ideas for racial and education justice. So thank you for giving me this time to speak to you all. Now I move to agenda item 1E, which is the executive director's report, Mary. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, commissioners and uh, stakeholders. Um, the room feels empty without you, but it's good to see your faces here and know that we are together again for the work that we do. Um, I have one item of business. I just want to remind you all that the nomination process is open for the appointment of a um, student liaison from an educator preparation program. That nomination process closes on June 30th, so please, in the midst of all of the things that are underway, if there is a candidate you'd like to nominate, please get that name uh, moved forward uh, by June 30th. Um, secondly, and picking up on some of the themes that Chair Sloan uh, put forth, uh, this has been a very moving time. Um, I think we're on day 93 of our shelter in place, teleworking from the agency. Uh, it's remarkable how well that's working for the staff and for the work of the commission. It's also remarkable how challenging it is to do our work apart from one another. Um, and all of us, I think, feel a little off balance and have been waiting for balance to, to return. Um, and yet with the, with the co-pandemics upon us of COVID-19 and this, this, the immediacy of racial justice, the need for us to work together for racial justice, uh, I think that's going to keep us off balance for a while in ways that I think are important uh, for both the learning that Chair Sloan uh, reminded us of in, in the letter that, that we wrote, but, but also for the contemplation of the deep action. I'm reminded of the, um, of the phrase, the, the immovable object meets the irresistible force. And I think about systemic institutional racism as an immovable object. 400 years, we haven't moved the object very far. But there's something about this moment with COVID, uh, with the events that have been occurring in our communities and continue to occur, the racial injustice that continues to occur in our communities almost daily, um, that are having both the physical impact on all of us and the physical threat of, you know, the potential of, of COVID, but the psychic and spiritual and behavioral impacts on us of, of just becoming more aware of the levels of injustice that perpetuate and are ongoing for members of our community. Um, this is a moment 
when I agree with uh, Chair Sloan, well, most of the time I do agree with Chair Sloan, but the, I have to lean into the opportunity as a human being and think that we are part of a moment in history and that we in this room, uh, it's a big room here, um, but we in this room have work to do to contribute to an improvement. We are part of the irresistible force that's going to meet the immovable object. And um, that's both terrifying on some level, but extremely exciting. And there's a call to action in the midst of that that I'm hearing. Um, and I'm really quite grateful to, to be at this table with the staff uh, and with you commissioners and with our stakeholders to, to figure out what our roles can be to, to move this object. So thank you, Madam Chair, turn it back to you. Thank you, Commissioner Sandy. Uh, do any commissioners have items to report? Commissioner Brown. I'm always grateful to be here, but particularly now, um, as I think about um, what we're experiencing and what we can do, what we can do better. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate um, commissioner, um, the commissioners here. Uh, Tina, your idea of what expertise we bring um, makes me feel a little more confident to raise my hand today. Um, briefly, I just wanted to let you know from the community colleges side, um, we are in we are heavily into in the midst of uh, trying to improve our system for students. Our focus is to be student ready. And what we're finding this year with what's been happening is it's particularly important um, that those of us who have, uh, who address teacher preparation step into the lead on this for our institutions. Um, in early childhood, for instance, we really look at the whole child, not just at the knowledge base we want them to achieve. Um, and in this case, we're really looking at uh, the whole student. Uh, because of that, the conversations that are happening at the community colleges around what it really takes to, to teach a student, and that means you need to know them and bring them into the process um, in a new way. In addition, all the community colleges this summer have moved to fully online as they quickly had to move to remote teaching um, in the spring. And the plan is for, to do the same in the fall. So for the community colleges, we are invested in intensive training um, for quality online teaching and learning, um, which is a really heavy lift when most of our community colleges um, have the majority of their courses and not just in education prep um, as being face-to-face. -face. Um, but our, our district, I just wanted to give you like a, a little piece. Our district has also has an incredible distance education um, team that's been working with our faculty for that heavy lift. And in doing that, has also reached out to the local county office of education and we've joined together um, to help offer some training for the TK-12s who will be going back to school, um, which is projected to be very diverse in terms of its application, as I'm sure we'll talk about um, today and tomorrow. Um, so I'm, I'm both interested and excited um, about the item today about early childhood education, um, but I'm also really, um, re-energized to do the work that we do um, for all of the children of California. So that's my, that's my little report. Thank you. Other commissioners, Commissioner Marks. Good morning, everyone. So um, when we began our lockdown and we began to go in our different corners of the world, um, my little corner of the world really, I think, did something quite innovative, and I would like to share it for a few moments. And then I'd like to close by sharing a poem my class and I composed as, as we find the world erupting and we 
find a way on how to move through it and become a finer human beings through it. Um, so I work at a public Waldorf school. There are three public Waldorf schools in the Sacramento region. Um, we have a very unique curriculum. We work with the children through many years. I've had the same children in my life for seven years. Um, so all three of these schools began to jo join together into a collaborative community where we wanted to meet the needs of children and their families during this lockdown period. And so what was created was a public Waldorf school community collaborative. And you can look that up. Um, and we devised a project-based curriculum that would support families, families that may have no technology at home or limited, may have many children in their home and varying degrees of parental support. And this curriculum is project-based. Each week is a new theme. Um, one week it could be arts of the world, another week it could be building a fort, but it takes the kindergarten through 12th grade world um, and it develops learning projects through the curriculum points. So we're talking language arts, math, writing, gardening, second language development, music, instruments, practical arts, and it works with that theme for the week. And it's just been such an inspiring um, journey to be on, to see what families create together. It um, is inspiring to see what middle school children create together. I've had some amazing um, creative things brought into the world because of their efforts and their families' efforts. Um, so, it, and it mostly it took children away from the screen and put them in nature, which is, as we all know, a very healing place to, to be. So as part of this project, my class and I got together and we talked about during this uncontrollable time, what can we do? Um, what can we hold on to and keep ourselves moving forward in a positive and meaningfully productive way? So we created the poem, No Matter What. No matter what, I will look for the positive in an otherwise negative time. No matter what, I will cherish the time with my family that I otherwise may not have. No matter what, I will find opportunities to serve others. No matter what, I will treasure my friends who inspire me. No matter what, I will miss my friends and all who work with me but they are with me. No matter what, I will mourn the loss of celebrating rites of passages together. No matter what, I will grieve with the world as we struggle to make it a better place for all. No matter what, I will long for the day when we can all share space safely together. No matter what, times are uncertain. No matter what, change is here. No matter what, I will embrace this change and be a positive part of it. No matter what, we have one another. Mm. Seventh graders. <laughs> That's thank great. You, Commissioner Marks, please thank your students for creating those words and thank you for sharing them with us. And I, I would love a copy of the poem, please. And I see others nodding their heads. Thank you. Uh, other commissioners, Commissioner Barnes, I saw you with your hand raised. Hi, everyone. Um, so there's just so much going on. And um, I'm on my district's uh, team to talk about what next year is going to look like, which, as you guys can imagine, changes daily, um, trying to come up with a plan. Um, and it, it's, it's hard because I, I, I feel like a broken record sometimes, but I, I keep trying to remind everybody, I understand curriculum is important. I understand, you know, making sure everyone can do their Google Classroom because if we come back and then we have to go back on, you know, all that's important. But um, I keep, and, and our CASC uh, is putting some stuff out to, for support. But when COVID just hit, even I was saying, if anyone thinks we can come back to school in whatever fashion that is, and just like the first day, I'm just going from the high school experience, you know, we have homeroom, we give you the rules, we give you your schedule, you know, all this kind of stuff goes on. If we don't 
none of that's going to matter because first with COVID, um, students were at home. Who knows what they were facing, what they were dealing with. Um, you know, we had a senior that we had to intervene with because um, his house was chaos and he was in jeopardy of not graduating and his home was chaos even before we went on shutdown. Um, there's others that it was interesting, you know, these kids love being on their phones and this and that, but you try to do a Google meet and they don't want to put their camera on. Um, and, you know, you try to say, oh, I just want to see your face and say hi. And then some tell you, I don't want you to see my house. Um, I don't want you to see the chaos or I don't want you to see where I live, um, you know, or Ms. Barnes, I didn't take a shower, you know, stuff like that. But now with everything happening now with the, with uh, what's going on in the country now, you know, I, I'm just, I just, my thing is, you can't come back to school and just go back to normal. We have to have some plan and some conversations and we have to have things in place for students and staff. I mean, this is affecting everyone. Um, and um, I, I know that the focus, I feel, yes, we have to have strong curriculum. And, and I'm very thankful that uh, Tony Thurman has come out and said, work with your counseling um, and, and mental health agencies and, and, and programs to have things in place. I know the big fear we all have in our profession is the last time around when cuts came, psychologists, social workers, and counselors were the first to be cut because we were deemed non-essential and furthest from the classroom. I'm not advocating somebody gets cut over somebody else. I just hope each district takes a real hard look and you know face the needs because if you got kids coming back who already, I, I listened to a great podcast on this and they said kids come to school with two backpacks. They come with their educational backpack and their emotional backpack. A lot of times their emotional backpack is way heavier than their educational backpack. Um, so it's a daunting thing and, and trying to work with kids online was, was hard. Um, it was a comfort level we all had to like get um, better with. I, I'm just hoping that conversations are being had at programs um, and districts and that, you know, we can't just have a blind eye that kids are going to come back and well, they're going to be so happy to come back. They're, they're probably going to be happy to be back at school, but some of them are not going to be ready to even, they're not going to care about work. Um, you know, that first day, if all we do is hand out assignments, we're doing a disservice. So um, I know I feel like I'm kind of all over the place with this because that's kind of where we are with this. We're all over the place with this. Um, and I just, I just have huge concerns. And I also, you know, I just hope everybody's keeping those things in mind and trying to come up with a plan as best we can because it changes, you know, daily. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. I always, um, when you speak from the school counseling world, it's so uh, important. It, um, it makes me think anew about what, where our priorities need to be oftentimes. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Martin, did I see you with your hand raised? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity and thanks for your opening to inspire all of us to share our local context as we do the most important work of this commission and bring what our local context is. And I know I'm new, I didn't say much at our first commission meeting, but for those of you who I haven't met, it's hard to meet in this environment, which is exactly what Commissioner Barnes just said. How do you create community? I wanna say thank you to Commissioner Marks for bringing the student voice in and remembering at the end of the day who we work for. Um, one of my quotes is from our, our arts, um, visual and performing arts department in San Diego Unified. Those of you that don't know me, I'm superintendent here in San Diego Unified. We're doing what everyone else is doing, figuring out how to open. But Commissioner Marks, when you brought in the student voice and what matters most, one of the things we say a lot recently is science is going to get us out of this, but art is going to get us through this. And so we've put visual performing arts at the center of what we're doing, both in the distance format and where we're going, going forward. And in all of our planning, lots of things, when you think about what gets cut and what we don't pay attention to anymore, we know we need counselors, nurses, custodial, and the arts. That's important and our communities matter. So um, I'm starting my comments by recognizing uh, fellow commissioners where you left off and passing to me, but I did want to actually start by acknowledging the heartbreak and the righteous anger that many of us are feeling about the events that have happened in the past several weeks, weeks nationally and that the death of an unarmed African-American man in police custody, and we should say his name because it matters. His name was George Floyd and he was a father. There was no excuse for his death, just as there was no excuse for some of the violence that has followed and even in our local community here 
Over the last couple of weeks, the young people in San Diego have been marching downtown against police, not all over the city, frankly, against police brutality and institutional racism. And they marched for all of us. The heartbreak and the righteous anger that we feel at this moment, we say is very real. And there's only a human response is the only thing that we can do to a senseless death like this. There's no excuse for the violent death. I wanna bring in the voice of the superintendents across the country. This is a statement from all of the superintendents of the large urban districts across the nation through the Council of Great. This time, I'm not sure if you heard that. Is my audio still working? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Martin, could you start again just with the statement? I think we it cut out for just a sec. Okay. Okay. This is a statement from all the superintendents with the Council of Great City Schools. Um, uh, across the nation, it's all the large urban districts across the United States. This time it was George Floyd, Floyd. Last time it was Ahmaud Aubrey. Before that, Breonna Taylor and so many others. Different names, different cities, but in every case, the underlying racism and ugliness are the same and will remain the same without dramatic changes to our institutions that address the conditions that allowed this killing to happen. This time it was the police who were caught in the crosshairs of public attention, but that sickening cell phone footage only captured a small piece of a larger picture, a vignette in the ongoing story of injustice and racism that is our nation's history and our current reality. Mortality statistics under COVID-19 remind us that the same patterns of injustice and inequity extend to healthcare and housing and to us in education. As we rise to meet the challenges of the current health crisis, to teach children remotely, feed our families, provide internet access, address the mental health of our needs of our youth, and fight budget cuts, let us, the leaders of our nation's urban public schools, amplify our efforts to meet this challenge to this enduring, defining challenge of our time. Let us ensure that our schools are safe havens, where all children are respected and nurtured, where all children can achieve and grow, and where all children are guaranteed equity and justice. The nation's urban public schools offer our full-throated condemnation of this killing and the racism behind it, and we vow to redouble our efforts to ensure racial, racial justice is at the center of everything we do. That's from the nation's public, large urban public school superintendents. Many of you know that I was also a second grade teacher, and one of the things that was most moving to me as I read about George Floyd's life was a statement from George Floyd's second grade teacher. Like her, she kept a sample of student writing of everything her students ever did. And I have a file folder for every student that I ever taught in my 17 years of teaching in the classroom. And George Floyd's second grade teacher held on to some of his writing from when he was in second grade. And it just moved me because I have a file folder. In fact, it's across the room. I meant to have it here so I could hold it up from a student. A reporter just interviewed me the other day and I'm looking at him saying, I know you. And he was one of my second grade students. So I pulled out his file and I'm about to mail it to him. So his teacher really, that she saved his writing. But what's even more impactful is George Floyd's second grade teacher, the piece of writing that she saved of his was his Black History Month assignment. The assignment that he did for Black History Month 38 years ago was um, to say, what, um, what does he dream of? And that was their assignment is what do you dream of someday? And it was maybe connected to I have a dream, I'm not sure what the exact assignment was, but in his assignment, the piece of paper that she saved of that is he dreamed of being a Supreme Court justice. That's what he did in his second grade assignment. He had the kind of big dreams that we encourage in all of our students. So I believe that we can build a world that protects the dreams of our young people and doesn't end them due to racism or institutional violence. I know that we can do better. I know that we must do better. And today's decision by the Supreme Court was tremendously important. And I think it just ties beautifully to what I just shared about George Floyd's second grade project of wanting to be a Supreme Court justice. For those of you that don't know, this morning they decided to protect DACA. It was introduced, which was introduced to help students get their. I don't need to go into that. I just want to say thank you for what happened this morning at DACA. And in, in our district, we actually opened an office after DACA was introduced to help our students get their transcripts 
and to apply for DACA protection. And I just would share for all of my colleagues that we found it helpful to refer everyone to the 2011 Department of Homeland Security memo that prohibited immigration from accessing our school campuses. And we remind our families and our school police of that memo frequently because we want everyone to know that schools are safe places and they're places where we can protect the dreams of our young people and we can have children succeed. Moving forward to our opening, and then I'll turn it over to all of my colleagues, our Board of Education unanimously approved our reopening plan on Tuesday night with key things in mind, safety, flexibility, keeping our families with us with the options that we know they need. We will open our campuses five days a week for people that need that on-campus on, on option, and we have a vastly improved upon distance learning option. We believe and know that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to look at education and leverage the collective talent, energy and passion of every single member of San Diego Unified's team and community to make our hopes and dreams a reality and the creativity that will be needed to make this on campus and online option work. Those that need to stay online because of their health conditions or work remotely, make that work. We will do that. We know that it means that we change our mindsets as we reimagine our new possibilities and new realities and new learning experiences for our students, for our staff, and for our families, and that this requires adaptive leadership. And um, we know that this is our job, and we're up for the challenge. I just finished the call with 200 principals, San Diego Unified, because the board took action Tuesday night, and we're getting to work to make it happen. I'll end with a quote from one of my favorite, all-time favorite authors is a woman named Margaret Wheatley. She said, the future doesn't take form in irrationally, even though it feels that way, the future comes from where we are now. The future won't change until we look thoughtfully at our present. We have sufficient human capacity to think and reflect together, to care about one another, to act courageously, and to reclaim the future. Now is the time to reclaim the future for our students. They deserve nothing less. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Martin, thank you. Thank you for all you do and thank you for being at this table. Uh, Commissioner Simmons. Well, I wanna thank uh, Commissioner Martin. I was going over her website and from her special board meeting Tuesday night and looking through the, the, the plan that San Diego has I, I, I think that as I look representing human resources offices, we are all in a very difficult position across the state where we're having to hire staff for next year without knowing exactly what model it is that we're going to use. And think about how much harder that must be for all of our new graduates who are just entering the workforce or trying to enter the workforce. We're, the commission worked so hard last uh, meeting to, to tear down barriers. We have the executive order that is helping our, our candidates find positions. And yet with the budget, we don't know that we're going to have positions. And with the model, we don't know that we're going to have positions. Just in Goleta, depending upon the model that we ultimately choose, I could either be overstaffed by six teachers or I could be, or I would need to hire 18 for fall. So until we get those things worked out, we're really in a, in a holding pattern. I really appreciated San Diego's commitment to opening school five days a week for the families that need it. I, uh, last night we had a board meeting where that we had um, 50 public comments and in a small district, I, I have been in Goleta for four years. Over the entire four years, we haven't had 50 public comments. And it was all very consistent about how that we need to incorporate black history into our curriculum. This is at the same time that some of the models we're looking at, if we go to like an AB model, we would have as little as 10 hours a week of instruction face to face. So how do we, how do we go forward? And because the, the instinct is to, is to teach reading and math and let everything else slide. But in this environment, we can't let that happen. So how is it that we're going to, as, as a state, how are we going to address the needs 
to still teach reading and math, but to not let social science and all of the importance that comes from that curriculum fall by the wayside. So it's a, um, it's a pickle. And uh, I really, uh, and I would encourage anybody to look at, uh, at uh, Commissioner Martin's uh, PowerPoint, because I think that it was, it was extremely well done. Thank you, Commissioner Simmons. <clears throat> I will be pulling up that website. Other commissioner reports. Commissioner Wall. So I've, <clears throat> I've been reflecting a lot that we live in an age of permanent white water. We might like to live on a time when the, the, the seas were calm, but we live in an age of permanent white water. I like that image. Uh, private not-for-profit institutions live in a, this time of change and tremendous ambiguity. They're all uh, trying to balance health, learning, individual needs of students, faculty, and staff. Um, or they're grappling with course formats, schedules, fieldwork realities, fiscal realities, and questions of justice. As we navigate wa wa Whitewater, I'm struck by how we develop patterns and habits, a structure of how we navigate change. These structures help us to cope with issues that are unanticipated and ambiguous but they also include structures that can be unjust. They help us to sometimes create institutional racism and injustice in the very creation of the structures. So I'm deeply reflective of the structures that we have been creating as institutions of higher education and how they advantage some and disadvantage others. And that as we continue to develop systems well-intended, we need to attend to the outcomes that can be unjust. We need to attend both to our, attention, our intentions and their outcomes. So I've been thinking a lot about navigating Whitewater together with people. And I am confident that you and us together can be even more conscious of the patterns, the systems we create, and the outcomes that happen as a result of them. Uh, private in, uh, institutions of higher education do this differently, but we're grappling, I think, tremendously with how we address the challenge in the current age of Whitewater. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Wall. Other commissioner reports? Commissioner Francois? Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all after such a long time. Um, I don't want to take up too much time speaking on the moment that we're in. I feel as though for the past month, I have been speaking on every Zoom about the moment we are in. And I'm so encouraged by the words of my fellow commissioners because you've so clearly captured everything that has been in, in my heart and in the t at the tip of my tongue. And I will say frankly that it feels good not to carry the emotional labor of that as a black woman in this time. So thank you all for that. I also want to acknowledge um, Executive Director Sandy and Chair Sloan for having the courage to make a statement for themselves. I know that when you sit in roles as you do for a government agency, rules, regulations, policies, politics, all of those things affect what you can and cannot say. And we might, you know, let's just put that on the table. Um, and that did not stop you from speaking your own truth into this moment. And I am really feel very honored to be part of this commission under your leadership, if for no other reason, but because of that, that you did not let this moment pass without using your platform to speak into it. Um, I also wanna say, I appreciate all of the comments of the commissioners and I appreciate all of the solidarity statements that have gone out over the past month. We have honored. The most recent individuals who have died at the hands of racial injustice in this in, in, in this world actually by a solidarity statements and what solidarity statements do for me is an opportunity to reflect on our deepest beliefs and values to articulate them to center them, to put them out on the table and to have them as a touchstone to where we're gonna move on from them. And even as I appreciate solidarity statements, they are only as good as the action that takes place as a result of them. And as a commission, I hope that we 
not only as individuals, but as a collective, will take these statements seriously. Learn and unlearn is something that struck me in the statement from, um, from Tina and, and, and Mary. We have so much to learn and we have to acknowledge that although we all come to this commission with deep histories, experiences, knowledge, abilities, and skills, we have a lot to learn. And there are individuals in our field who have done this work of anti-racism and justice for decades. And we need to hear their voices. And I'm hoping that this moment helps us to hear them with open hearts and open ears with a mind towards learning, but also unlearning. I hope that we will create structures within this commission that we can learn from others so that when we take up these important um, policies that, that the state is holding us responsible for, for framing, that we go into it with a different lens. We've talked on this commission about cultural responsiveness. We have talked about equity. We are now being pushed to talk more about anti-racism. I would push us more to think in this moment about anti-Black racism. We don't have the expertise on this commission to move forward alone in this. We need to listen to the field of scholars and practitioners whose life's work has been not only in preparation for this moment, but they've been carrying the torch for this when nobody else would listen. So let's remember who they are and let's bring them to the table to educate us about how we can, as a commission can move forward. Lastly, I would say on this subject that the young people, well, two things. First, I want to, um, I want to reiterate what um, Commissioner Wall said. I have been so inspired and encouraged and impressed by the educators of our young people, from teachers to leaders to counselors, and how they have responded both to this pandemic, but also to the manifestation of the hurt and trauma that particularly the Black community has undergone in the last month. They are li literally the folks on the ground who have had to deal with this, and they have done it with all of their hearts, all of their skills, even as they are trying to take care of their own families in this moment. So I wanna acknowledge them. Let us not forget that we are sitting in a commission meeting. They are sitting on Zooms with young people and their families who are experiencing trauma in ways that they could not have imagined on March 1st. Second, I would say that the students are watching us. They are watching us even as they are leading us in this moment. I want them to see the adults in their lives being willing to take the risks and the chances and stand up for justice that they are taking for us and for our future. So thank you all um, for your previous comments. Um, I gotta say, I love each and every one of you for what you all, every, every word that was spoken this morning was beautiful and it gets, it keeps me encouraged. As for a report, see how I can shift really quickly? A report, I do have to say that UC Berkeley was awarded the um, CDE, CCE, um, 21st Century California School Leadership Academy Statewide Center um, grant. And what that means is that they will be working with several um, regional academies across the state on improving site level leadership, as well as higher level leadership in schools with a focus on um, equity and instructional or uh, instructional leadership. Um, UCLA is partners in this work and we are looking forward to really changing the way leaders are prepared, leaders are developed and the work that they do on their school sites through this um, statewide work. It's gonna be quite exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Francois. Commissioner Grano Shire. Good morning, colleagues. It is um, very good to see all of you, and I hope you and your families are well. I want to share uh, some work in communication that's been happening in the CSU uh, Educator Preparation Leadership group. Um, we believe that schools are the epicenter to dismantle racism and inequities. 
if this is true, as we've been asking ourselves on our, on all morning, what is our role as educators? What do educator preparation programs need to include to ensure that future teachers, counselors, and leaders have the knowledge and skills to educate their students to ensure equity and excellence for all students? What mindset do we want our candidates to demonstrate when they leave our programs? What content and clinical experiences do our programs need to provide to prepare all of our students to become culturally responsive educators who can be agents of change that we so need at this time. The tragic death of Mr. George Floyd while being restrained by the Minneapolis police and numerous other black men and women before him has shook our leadership team to their core. Our hearts are broken for the Floyd family and other black families who continue to face systemic racism, injustice, and hostility in schools, workplaces, and in our communities. We resolve to continue our work at the system level to support the development of programs to recruit, prepare, and retain teachers of color with a specific focus on African-American men. To this end, this summer, we're hosting a series of webinars focusing on equity, inclusion, social justice and historic injustices directed at people of color. The series will feature speakers who recognize the historical and systemic disparities and opportunities and outcomes in our schools and communities. And these faculty will share the resources necessary to address these disparities and ultimately dismantle the systemic barriers. The series will lift up the good work of our campus faculty and students who are engaged in work to ensure culturally responsive educators for our students, schools, and communities. We're in the process of reaching out to our faculty right now. We have four dates and four proposed topics that I will send to commissioners. Um, these, uh, this webinar series will be open to all colleagues and I hope you will join us. The other update is um, that the CSU was awarded um, three million from um, uh, the state legislature to establish the Center to Close Achievement Gaps. Uh, we are working very closely right now with the assembly member who um, helped to secure these funds to change the title of the center. Um, our faculty um, have developed some very compelling rationale for why we need to refocus the attention mm -hmm. on our students um, and take move away from that defi deficit perspective that that center seems to connote. But to that end, I wanna just give you that update. The center will be located at Cal State Long Beach and will be a system-wide center, um, will serve as um, a center to disseminate resources to our K-12 partners and our higher ed partners. And as the center grows, I will share that information with you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Grenoshire. Other commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Rodriguez. Thank you, good morning, everyone. I'm a little reluctant to unmute because there's a lot of noise happening and the dogs are going nuts. So hopefully they'll, during this time, they'll be able to uh, keep, keep it down. Um, anyway, I, I, I wanna say how pleased I was to see the letter um, written by Chair Sloan and uh, Executive Director Sandy. I read it with a lot of delight and agreement. Um, I've uh, really enjoyed everything that uh, I've heard this morning and I want to echo Commissioner Francois's um, statement about, you know, there's, there's what we say and then there's what we do. And I really want us to follow up with anti-racist lenses so that everything that we do, that we take that into consideration because we're one of the institutions that has a tremendous impact on these issues and on, on society as a whole, right? And we know from a sociological perspective that when one institution is affected, and I think that's what we're seeing right now in our society, institutions are just kind of like, you know, uh, in some ways imploding or moving and shaking. And, and we have a tremendous opportunity because we also have, um, as Chair Sloan mentioned, leadership at the state level, uh, Governor Newsom, you know, what I've, what I've heard in his press briefings is 
Um, he's not interested in dilly dallying around. He really wants to get, uh, he wants to go deep. Um, in addition to um, Superintendent Thurman and Chair Linda Darling Hammond um, at the State Board of Education, uh, they, uh, they, they get, you know, the depth of a lot of the work that a lot of us have been doing is sort of culminating into um, this moment and, and the leadership that we have at the state level. And, um, you know, as Commissioner Francois said, people who have been doing a lot of this work. Um, and so anyway, thank you so much. I really, I, I just, uh, I was in tears as I was listening to you um, speak this morning because this is, you know, it's, it's, it's what we do. This is what we do and what we have to undo as well. Um, you know, going with the learning and unlearning. And also I'd like to um, acknowledge Governor Newsom's leadership with COVID-19. I think he's done a tremendous job in compassionately protecting Californians as much as we have let ourselves be protected because there's still resistance. Um, we lost a colleague last week at my school and she left her children behind and our our community you know like some of our leadership is just begging to reopen and we are a hot spot in imperial county we have um you know we're just we're growing and and uh thank god governor newsom said in his briefing a few days ago in Pearl county um, you know, you don't meet the, the criteria for the attestation because we just, it seems like we keep getting worse, you know, and, and while people I've seen all over uh, newspapers throughout the country blaming our proximity to the border, perhaps that may have a little bit to do with it, but it's really people just not sheltering in place, not wearing masks and, um, you know, being all over the place. So, I hope that, that communities take this seriously. This is a pandemic and, um, and we're losing people. I, I have a few loved ones right now in intensive care, um, you know, and I'm just uh, worried, constantly worried because we are, um, you know, the health when it comes to poverty and race is, is definitely a big issue. So I hope that you please keep our community, our county in your thoughts and um, you know that we can that we can return to a sense of normalcy. Uh, and Commissioner Barnes, the the backpack analogy or the backpack metaphor was a great one because we do have you know our students that carry their backpacks and their parents' backpacks and societal's backpacks. You know they're just like like these huge loads. So um, thank you, thank you. For, it's such an honor to serve with such thoughtful and intelligent and soulful commissioners. Thanks. I was gonna leave the meeting, but no, I'm just gonna mute. Thank you. Hi, Day. I'm sending you a big hug. We all are. Uh, Commissioner Jackson. Hi. Um, I I really didn't know that I wanted to say anything, but first of all, I want to acknowledge um, Commissioner um, uh, Francois, uh, her announcement about the center and work with um, uh, leaders at the various schools at men and in the district. Um, that's work that came out of, out of my office and we all had a hand in it and we're very proud of that work and we're, we're really looking forward to, you know, um, you know, the future of leaders at the schools and in the districts being, you know, very much in tune and prepared and, and ready to work with their staff and work with family and work with students. So thank you for announcing that. And, um, and I just, I want to say, I appreciate all of the comments that have been made. Um, this morning, it's it's an emotional time. And I just wanted to add a little personal part. Uh, this time last year, I was on a road trip, an extraordinary road trip uh, with 
like 29 other people, closest friends down to Alabama. And we got up first thing in the morning uh, after arriving in the evening the next morning and went to the Peace and Justice Memorial. And I, I just, you know, I'm just going to say it. I lost it. I was by myself. We all kind of spread out and I lost it approaching those, those columns just hanging row after row after row. Um, and just somehow knowing that everyone thinks that's just the distant past, that lynchings are a distant past, but they're not. They're, we've seen that evidence so clearly in our country that it is not a past situation, that it's very much with us. And I kept thinking in that moment as I walked through that memorial that every American should go to that memorial and then let's have a conversation about what's going on in this country. And I just wanted to share that because it's it's been like a year ago and I had, you know, who could foresee that it would be it would be here and now that we're having to have these discussions, these protests, the, the anger, the hurt, the trauma. And all I could think about was I started almost a year ago in the Department of Ed, but I spent 34 years in the classroom. And all I can think about these days are my students that I've had and, and, and what they must be going through and what they must be thinking, what their families must be going through now. And so I too appreciate all of you and and let's turn words into action. I think it's important. Thank you, Commissioner Jackson. Other commissioner reports? <clears throat> okay. Uh, <clears throat> Agenda item 1G, do any liaisons have items to report? Uh, liaison Strauss? Well, good morning, everybody. And um, I'm, I'm really honored to be here with you and representing the State Board of Education. Um, things have changed so much. Um, even since our last remote meeting, um, our State Board met remotely in May and will meet remotely again in July. And um, there's been so much that's happened. So I just feel like I wanna make some, some comments. Um, we've had a bunch of state leader meetings and comments have been, if we think about January, how hard it was to be a kid in January and to realize now how much harder it is based on what's happened. Um, what we know is that everybody's tired. It's been really hard for kids. It's been really hard for parents. Teachers, I know person are exhausted. Leaders are not getting much sleep. Um, and everybody is trying their hardest to do their best. But I think um, what we realize is we're not going back, we have to go forward. And we not only have to take the issues of the pandemic and safe and trusting and distance and blended learning, but we have to take the racial injustices and we have to really rethink how we um, go about creating safe, equitable learning opportunities for every one of our kids. Um, we've also seen during this pandemic, um, huge gaps and inequities for all kinds of different special needs students, students that do not have um, access to internet, do not have um, digital devices. There's four kids trying to share one computer. So there's been a huge amount of challenges and a thanks to leaders like Cindy Martin and others in our state who have really stood up and really taken on the challenge of 
of all that we've learned. And that, as you know, Linda Darling Hammond has played an important role at the state board level and working collaboratively with the governor's office and with Tony Thurman and CDE. Um, the state board also is limited in the areas that they have authority, just like the Credential Commission is limited in the areas that you have authority. And so some of the things that have happened have happened from governor executive orders and also with the legislature. Um, but I do feel like I want to bring you up to date on some things that we are talking about, particularly that might be helpful um, going forward um, or not, but at least uh, from the role and responsibility of the state board. Um, first, you obviously know that um, since we haven't been in session, there was a waiver granted by the federal government that we took advantage of, um, and there is no assessments for this spring. And because there's no assessments, there won't be a dashboard this fall. We will report um, assessments at, the, at least at this point in 21. So it'll be from 19 to 21. Um, currently that discussion of what the dashboard and uh, assess um, and will look like is actually going on in the legislature right now. So there'll be an update when they um, complete that conversation. Um, but that's made an interesting impact for districts who've been doing all kinds of things, distance learning, meal, um, distance um, meal supplies and childcare. And so the districts were challenged with just a short one page L learning, LCAP, local control accountability plan, just to deal with that. Um, there'll be an update once we know the budget because we don't know the budget yet and we're keeping our fingers crossed. It's a lot better than we've been told. Um, and then um, in the spring of 21, there'll be a new three-year uh, three LCAP that districts will, although we all know that 2021 is not going to be a normal school year at all. Um, and I think uh, we have to really think differently about what we're doing, as we've all talked about. Um, for those of you in um, teacher and leader education. Just so you know, we have a new visual and performing arts approved framework coming to the state board in July. So Cindy and her team could be embracing that along with, I know my sister who's a music teacher is very excited for the new um, standards, but I think, I think uh, Cindy made a really good point that we need to think about integrating content, not just dealing with math and, and literacy, but, and I, I know I speak for science leaders saying too, we wanna make sure that project-based learning is incorporated. We also have a world language framework that's been gone through all the vetting process. That's also coming to the state board in July for approval. So be aware of that. And our, our ethnic studies, which I think is more important now than ever is in an, in an editing stage. It's coming back to us um, sometime, we think in August, but this, during the 20 year and back to the state board, um, it had to be revised to deal with the state board guidelines and some legal guidelines. So it's actually in the final process. It goes first to Instructional Quality Commission and then it goes back to the state board. So there'll be so, a lot more input. There was more than 20,000 comments on it um, and there's a quite a bit of interest and now more than ever, I think we'll provide a good guidance document um, to four districts. Um, and just a, a couple other things. Um, we are, we've been talking about a growth measure and how to look at students' predictable growth. We're one of only a couple of states in the country that hadn't adopted one. And we've had quite a bit of interest by our stakeholders that we use that. So in July at our state board meeting, we will be talking about that. Um, so if you have particular interest, um, that input would be helpful. And also we've been looking at our subgroups and how students are doing. And we've been concerned about some of our measures because of small group sizes, um, maybe being more volatile. So we've asked the Department of Ed to run some um, simulations to make sure we're doing the right kind of um, gauging for different groups in our accountability. Um, I, I think an, a one thing you um, might be interested in, um, we have a state literacy task force that's been working on some state funding to just like we have CSLA for the school leaders, there'll be some funding coming out in literacy. So um, really an important process. And then for those of you in mathematics and particularly early mathematics, there's a project that's free on uh, Friday, the 26th of June, there'll be the state early mathematics symposium remote. And so if some of your teachers and leaders want to join that, I think it will be a great resource. It's pre-K through third grade. So um, I just wanted to give you a highlight. And I, just to summarize by saying, again, we're limited in the areas that state board um, 
um, has responsibility and authority for. So the Department of Ed under uh, State Superintendent Thurman has been doing tremendous amount of guidance, uh, lots of webinars, lots of stakeholder engagement and lots of announcements. So I think together with all the governor's office, CDE and state board, we are really committed to doing things differently going forward so that all kids have a safe and trusting place to come to school, to be respected and to learn so that they they grow and meet their potential. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Liaison Strauss. Are there any other commissioner reports? Liaison reports? Uh, commissioner Rodriguez? Yes, thank you. Um, so on May 7th, we had a committee on accreditation meeting and you can probably hear all the noise in the background and the dogs starting, uh, but I will keep this short. Um, so there were a few uh, accreditation reports. We had a, uh, a vote for to for the chair and co-chair. So um, they voted to retain Robert Freely and Anna Moore co-chair. Uh, discussing the important work that they're doing. Uh, we met electronically, as um, you can imagine. And uh, the COA will be meeting again next week. So um, there will be another meeting at that point. And there is some uh, other work that's going on, but it was um, mostly information items. And uh, we'll see uh, the work in that respect when it comes to us for a vote. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rodriguez. Any other liaison reports? Seeing none. Commissioners, before we move to agenda item 1H, I uh, want to just say that uh, I know we have only been at this for an hour and 25 minutes. But um, my emotional backpack is particularly full at the moment. And I think we maybe need a 10 minute break as we transition into our work, if that's okay with you. So if we could please come back again at 1035. And meanwhile, um, I'm sending you all a big hug and I sure wish I could do that in person and I can't wait until I do it again. Uh, I'll, I'll see you in 10 minutes. Okay, welcome back, commissioners. Thank you. Thank you for all of your comments this morning. Thank you for uh, a moment to stretch. Now we are transitioning into all of our work and the actions that we will be taking. Uh, okay, next uh, agenda item 1H is update on actions addressing the COVID-19 crisis, considerations for 20. 2021 20, and possible additional actions for commission consideration. This item will be presented by Terry Clark, Aaron Scooball, and Amy Rising. Ms. Scooball, will you please begin? Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Agenda item 1H serves two purposes. First, it will summarize the many actions related to teacher preparation. Oh, can you all hear me? Okay, I'm gonna get really close to the mic. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start at the beginning. Agenda item 1H serves two purposes. First, it will summarize the many actions related to teacher preparation and licensure that have been taken by you all at the commission, the governor and the legislature to reduce the hardships faced by current and prospective educators related to COVID-19. Terry, Amy, and I will briefly cover the work that each of our divisions has been doing to assist the field and the public with navigating the flexibilities that now exist. Then Terry's going to talk a little more about what the future may hold and what actions you all may wish to consider as we move forward in our new normal. So let me begin by first acknowledging the amount of hard work and dedication that both my staff in the certification division and the staff of PSD and the performance assessment team have shown. Over the past four months, we have produced several pages of FAQs and guidance documents for educators and employers to assist in navigating the flexibilities approved by you all at the April Commission meeting and the more recent flexibilities offered through executive order. 
My team in certification has been providing expanded live chat hours for the field and educators to connect with credential analysts and answer their certification questions. The team was also able to immediately add new database elements to the Commission's credentialing system to ensure that staff can track the number of CBEST deferral requests, extensions, and program sponsor variable term waivers that we received related to COVID-19. Our assignment team has been hard at work as well, providing outreach and guidance to the field as schools begin the process of preparing and hiring for the upcoming school year. Assignment staff has developed guidance that highlights several options that LEAs can use for flexibility in assignments, including local assignment options and short-term waivers controlled at the local level. The guidance also provides clarification on various models for distance and online learning and the certification requirements when students are being taught remotely by a live instructor or when instruction is software-based only. The team also recorded a training webinar that addresses options for assigning teachers during COVID-19 and will continue to provide outreach and training as the school year progresses. As well, in April through mid-May, staff in PSD and certification worked closely together to perform several webinars for commission-approved programs and employers. These webinars were held focusing on groups of programs, so specifically preliminary teaching, teacher induction, administrator induction, specialized services programs, and webinars for the field. These webinars connected with credential analysts at charter schools, districts, county offices, and preparation programs. The table on page one of your item provides links to the recordings of these webinars, as well as the question and answer documents that were developed based on the questions that were asked in each of the sessions. All in all, the teams were able to share information with over a thousand credential analysts and program sponsors through the various webinars, which was a huge success. So at this point, I'd like to give Amy an opportunity to share the work done in the world of performance assessments. I'll hand it over to you, Amy. Thank you, Erin. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, lots of work has been underway and we are looking forward to a busy uh, future of additional supports. But just to um, bring you up to date on what we have been offering, the performance assessment team um, has done just an amazing amount of work uh, to provide outreach and support as we have moved through these last months together. And uh, we, I also want to mention uh, our technical contractor evaluation systems has been right there with us to make sure that we can offer this range of supports. Um, the supports include written guidance documents, uh, a whole series of online learning seminars, and uh, monthly we offer what we call virtual think tanks where faculty come together on the last Friday of the month around a particular topic related to performance assessment or the teaching performance expectations, and they talk together about best practices, so we have been offering those. Uh, in addition, every Thursday, we hold office hours, the staff and I, with our technical contractor so that we can talk directly with any program engaged in performance assessment that has a question so um, that we can be there for them. And uh, in addition, I want to talk a little bit about our growing relationship with an organization called Q Computer Using Educators. They have come alongside uh, with us to offer their expertise and support in helping all of us think about online learning settings and how we can support our programs uh, to move towards supporting candidates who are now working in online synchronous settings, asynchronous settings, sometimes in person, uh, and the whole mix of supports that we now see learning happening in. Um, in addition, all of the work that we do offer, we do archive it and provide it. Uh, and many of these webinars now are provided on the Commission's YouTube channel, and we provide links to that to make sure people can get the information they need. Um, in addition to this work, I just want to uh, talk for a minute about work going forward. We will be uh, offering a lot of support to our induction programs around performance assessments and the expectations because they will be receiving uh, approximately 7,000 or so candidates moving from our preliminary programs into the, their employment and therefore into induction programs and they will need to complete a performance assessment. So we will again uh, be offering a whole range of supports uh, starting this summer through the fall and into probably next spring 
and uh, we will use a combination of online webinars. Uh, we will also offer additional office hours. So not only office hours for our preliminary programs every week, but now an office hour dedicated specifically to our induction colleagues. And we have also decided to offer an hour of weekly support to candidates. So no matter where they are, if they have a question, they can get to us directly. Um, we were able this past year to develop program assessment guides that really lay out the foundation and the theory of action behind our performance assessments. And we have those guides available now and we think that they will be helpful. Um, a final uh, point that I wanna share with you is that uh, in July, um, we were going to hold, uh, last year we had our first uh, in-person implementation conferences where we brought faculty together to talk about best practices, both for the administrator assessment and for the performance of teacher performance assessment. Uh, this year we decided obviously we needed to not uh, skip over that important opportunity for programs to share best practice, but to offer it online through Zoom. So in July, we will be offering um, our teaching performance assessment on July 22nd between 8.30 and 3, a uh, whole series of seminars by faculty for faculty. We have um, brought EdTPA teaching performance assessment uh, users into this conference. We have invited our induction colleagues to join this conference to get a head start on what uh, we're experiencing around embedded performance assessments. And we've also invited our special education community because as you all know, we are building a special ed teaching performance assessment. So the sooner they come and join our colleagues uh, and have those discussions about support to uh, educators, the better. So it, we're hoping uh, for a big crowd to be with us on July 22nd. And um, we will also offer an implementation conference for our administrative uh, community. And that will be on July 29th, also from eight until three uh, via Zoom with um, all kinds of presentations by our faculty around all of the kinds of things they have been learning during this first year of administration for um, our administrative candidates. And so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Terry Clark, who's going to take you through the rest of the item. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Good morning, commissioners. So staff had just completed that range of activities that Aaron and Amy described to you when on May 29th, a Friday evening, of course, an executive order from the administration was released. This order impacts two distinct groups of educator candidates. The first group is those completing their preparation now in the spring and summer of 2020. And the second group is those who are applying and beginning their preparation in the fall of the 2020-21 year. Parts of the executive order overlap with some of the flexibilities that you adopted in April. This gives some candidates more options and it also gives candidates and individuals that did not previously have any options, it gives some of them an option. So the first group of candidates, those who are completing their preparation. In the area of performance assessments, two provisions exist in this executive order, uh, addressing both the TPA and the APA. If a candidate has completed all credential and program requirements except for the performance assessment, the executive order moves that requirement that the individual pass a performance assessment to the clear credential level. The candidate will be recommended by their preliminary program for the preliminary credential, and the preliminary credential will have either a TPA or an APA renewal code identified with it. The executive order identifies criteria that each candidate must meet to be eligible for this postponement of the performance assessment. Included in the criteria is that the candidate needs to have been enrolled in the 2019-20 year, be completing the program in spring or summer of 2020 and been prevented from meeting that performance assessment requirement due to COVID. So this part of the executive order impacts candidates completing preliminary multiple subject, single subject and administrative services programs. A third provision of the executive order also impacts program completers. This is completers of multiple subject and education specialist programs. This part of the executive order provides relief for those candidates who've completed all their credential requirements other than passing the reading instruction competency assessment known as the RECA. The executive order moves the RECA requirement to a clear credential requirement. For those who've completed the program, 
but were unable to take the RECA between March 19th and August 31st of 2020 due to testing center closures or the limited availability of examinations due to COVID. Unlike the performance assessment requirement, the individual who is recommended for a preliminary credential with a RECA renewal code does not have to have been enrolled in a teacher preparation program during the 2019-20 year. They could have completed the program in a prior year. With the flexibilities that you adopted in April, namely the program sponsor variable term waiver and the options for program completers in the executive order, staff developed some flowcharts, one for teacher preparation, one for administrative preparation, to help the preliminary programs and the credential analysts determine which credential or the waiver is appropriate to be recommended for each candidate. The options include the usual preliminary credential, the preliminary credential with a TPA or an APA renewal code, a preliminary credential with the RECA renewal code, or the program sponsor variable term waiver. Appendix B of this item provides the teacher preparation guidance document that begins with the flowchart. The administrator preparation guidance document is available on the COVID Actions webpage. Now to the second group of individuals that the executive order impacts, those beginning their educator preparation. Two assessment requirements have been suspended by the executive order for candidates beginning their preparation in the 2021 year. Basic skills for all applicants and subject matter requirement for teacher intern applicants. Because of the executive order, applicants may enter an educator preparation program without meeting the basic skills or CBEST requirement. The requirement must be met prior to recommendation for the preliminary credential though. The Education Code requires that teacher intern candidates must meet the subject matter requirement, most often met by passing the appropriate CSET exams or completing a commission of her subject matter program, before the candidate is eligible to be recommended for an intern credential. Because of COVID and the testing center closures, the executive order suspends this requirement. Individuals may be recommended for an intern credential, including those individuals who have held STIPs and or PIPs, the subject matter requirement does still need to be met prior to recommendation for the preliminary credential. So once the executive order was posted, staff posts additional guidance and held additional webinars with programs and employers to explain the additional flexibilities. Page six of your item provides links to those webinar archives and the actual guidance documents. In addition to the executive order, there are a few additional flexibilities that are included in the budget trailer bill language. Annually, the state develops, the legislature passes, and the governor signs a state budget. There are some bills called trailer bills that provide additional guidance related to that year's funding. And there are two items in the trailer bill language that are of interest to the educator preparation community. When the governor signs the state budget, the trailer bill language becomes effective. The first item is the extension by one year of the time that an examination score is valid for use towards a California credential. Title V regulations specify that all examinations, other than CBEST, which never, it, the passing score there never expires, but for all other examinations, there is a 10-year period when the passing score is valid. And after that 10-year period, the passing score expires. If an examination score has not been used towards a credential within the 10 years, that passing score will have expired and would not be able to be used. So the trailer bill language is, includes a provision that the validity period for the use of all examination scores is 11 years from March 19th of 2020 through June 30th of 2021. This should mean that no candidate who is moving towards becoming a licensed educator has a score um, expired due to COVID. The second area in the trailer bill is the area of pupil personnel services programs. The clinical practice requirements have some very specific requirements that each candidate has to meet. They must have at least 100 hours of clinical practice in a minimum of two different grade level bands, elementary school, middle school, high school. Pupil personnel program shared that documenting that each candidate has completed at least 100 hours in two of these grade bands has been challenging when the schools had to so quickly pivot to distance learning in the spring of this year and that there are many uncertainties for the 2021 year. 
So the trailer bill language removes the requirement for multiple placements and the 100 hour minimum for the placements for this year's completers and next year's completers. This provision will go through June of 2021. The programs, of course, are still required to ensure that their candidates are prepared for the full range of services that the completer will be performing. After all the things that are in place now, we need to start to think about the 2021 year in educator preparation. A lot is unknown at this time, and the expectation is that the year will be different in different geographic regions of the state, in specific schools and specific districts. The preparation programs are working with the local education agencies in their areas to begin to understand how school will open in this fall. The April Commission meeting staff developed that list of flexibility options for your consideration based on the knowledge of the program standards, the credential requirements, and the questions we've been receiving from programs and from employers. The Commission acted to approve a suite of flexibility options shown in Appendix A of this item. It's not clear, though, that those same flexibilities will be appropriate for the 2020-21 year. Candidates who completed preparation in spring or summer of 2020 completed over half of their preparation. And for multi-year programs such as counseling or school psychology, they completed the vast majority of their preparation as the program was designed and approved with clinical experiences in the public schools as we have known public schools to be prior to March of 2020. This fact really allowed the staff to recommend and the commission to approve that range of flexibilities. But it's not clear that for candidates beginning their preparation in fall of 2020, how much of their preparation and their clinical experiences will be possible to be delivered as the program was initially designed. So to gather information on what might be appropriate flexibilities and possibly some appropriate specificities for the 2021 educator preparation world, staff is working to include a wide range of stakeholders. Based on information that we gather, staff will prepare an agenda item for the August Commission meeting. One of the groups has already begun meeting, and they're identified on page 7 of your item. These individuals have identified and agreed to serve as liaisons to their segment, the representatives for the California State University, the University of California, the private colleges and universities, and district intern programs. They're collecting information from programs in their segment. They're also going to be sharing information. This group is meeting on a weekly basis, working on a survey to gather information from programs and what might be helpful and useful. Another area where it's clear that additional supports and guidance will be necessary is in the area of induction. Both teacher and administrator induction. Preliminary teacher preparation programs and administrative services programs each have a standard that specifies what a program must do related to a performance assessment. Program Standard 5 for teachers and Program Standard 8 for administrators. But with the inclusion of approximately 7,000 new teachers and administrators in induction who will still need to complete and pass a performance assessment, staff from both the Performance Assessment Development Division and the Professional Services Division are working to understand, organize, and provide the necessary supports to induction programs. Staff will be contacting leaders from these two types of programs to meet to be, discuss the inclusion and induction of these educators who still need to pass a performance assessment. On page 9 of the item, you see an initial analysis of the teacher preparation program standard related to the TPA. Parallel work will take place with the administrator world, and discussions will take place to really gather information from the programs. In addition, for multiple subject and education specialist teachers, many of them will begin their induction program and still have a RECA requirement to meet. Induction programs have not previously taught or supported candidates to prepare for and pass the RECA. So the group of program leaders will discuss both performance assessment and the RECA. They're going to advise staff on supports the programs will need to effectively support new educators. A report from this work will also be included at the August meeting. In addition to these identified groups, staff will continue to reach out to employers, bargaining associations, other education groups, and education leaders to gather information about the 2020-21 year and the implications for educator preparation. A final area we want to be sure to point out is 
Another area of the Commission's responsibility is the child development permit, the early care and education world. You have a very rich item on your agenda for tomorrow. Dr. Phyllis Jacobson is currently reaching out to the early childhood community to gather information on how the 2020-21 year will impact both the preparation, including field experiences, and the employment of early childhood educators. So for our next steps, this is only an information item documenting the work that has taken place and foreshadowing the work that's going to take place between now and your August meeting. The next step section identifies that after meeting with the variety of stakeholders, staff is going to prepare an agenda item for your August meeting. It will have recommendations for your consideration and possible action. And this concludes the presentation for this item. We'll be happy to answer any questions if we can. Thank you, uh, Terry Clark, Aaron, Scooball, and Amy Rising. That was a very um, comprehensive and informative presentation of the item. We'll now open for public comment. Uh, recording Secretary, are there any public comments? Yes, there are. The first is Jane Robb. Good morning, this is Jane Robb from the California Teachers Association. I wanted to speak specifically to the section on certificated assignments on page 1H2 in the agenda item. First, a big shout out and thank you to the staff um, in the assignment unit and Aaron Scooball for putting together this new guidance section. It's useful, it's timely, and it's responsive to um, needs in the field, so thank you. Unfortunately, it's also behind a password protected firewall. Um, we're requesting that, that those new pages are also linked to the public access COVID-19 information pages for all stakeholders that are on the regular commission's website, not the credential information guide. Um, although the agenda item states that an individual can email the CTC for login information, that seems unnecessarily burdensome for both commission staff and for stakeholders. Um, and if it's not publicly accessible, and if a person doesn't read today's agenda to know that, which I would submit most people have not read today's agenda, um, they won't know that it even exists. So we're requesting that as soon as possible, um, as we all know from Commissioner Simmons and Commissioner Martin's comments, schools are well underway into planning for next year and this information can be really helpful that that information now be linked to the public access website rather than behind um, a password protected wall. So thank you very much. Thank you. Jane, Rob, uh, are there other public comments? Yes, next is Carrie Yi. Carrie Yi, are you there? Yes, I am, I'm sorry. No worries. Um, Thank you everybody for allowing me to speak and thank you, Ms. Clark, for answering all of my questions so far. Um, the reason I'm on here is that I'm a former candidate of Cal State Teach from 2016 and I had finished my program but could not seem to pass as of yet, um, Rika. Um, I went on to be a substitute teacher for the past four years and especially my last assignment being in special education. Um, what I'd like is some clarification um, on a timeline of when programs, even former programs, um, would grant us also the preliminary credential. Um, it would be nice to be I'm able done. to have, it would be nice to be able to have this, um, in order to be able to teach as a teacher of record. Um, so if, if there's a timeline that could, can be given, because so far what we've heard is the wait and see is um, we'll work on the current students and then we'll see how that goes 
and work backwards. And meanwhile, teachers that are waiting, like myself, are going to be losing any potential positions. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Yee. Um, we will certainly be taking this into consideration. Uh, are there additional public comments? Surette Kamins Kaminsky, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Good morning, Commissioners, Chair Sloan and Executive Director Sandy. My name is Sarah Kaminsky, representing CSESA, the County Superintendent Association. I just want to thank CTC staff for all their hard work supporting the field with their frequent webinars, online documents, and their efforts to also attend meetings with county officials to answer burning questions. Staff's been extremely responsive, and we appreciate them listening to questions from the field and incorporating recommendations into further CTC guidance. It's been a trying time under COVID-19, and we appreciate CTC's rapid response and partnership with the field to keep our school systems running. I also want to offer county offices as a resource for future discussions regarding the child development permit, as well as the program leader collaborative input group outlined on page seven. Thank you again for all of your hard work. Thank you, Ms. Kaminsky. Are there additional public comments? We don't have any other comments. Thank you. Thank you. Do commissioners have any questions or comments on this item? I'm looking, Commissioner Wall. I, I first just wanna state my, my deep appreciation for the tremendous work that continues to go on to address uh, the ambiguities and challenges with this time that the commission is doing. And it, it is clear that there is constant effort to try to adapt to new situations. And I suspect that this will continue, that we have not reached sort of a, a final place. Um, and I also think that there has been a, a tremendous effort to communicate and interpret uh, dynamics. And, and I know from speaking with institutions that they're deeply appreciative of these efforts, but also there continues to be need, right? Um, to, to understand um, how to interpret accurately and to, to balance flexibility with the desire to provide the very best preparation. Um, and I, I hope we just continue these efforts and we continue the dialogues that are occurring. Um, you know, this is an incredibly detailed item and, and it reflects the amount of work um, that um, is going into this and, and, and the complexity also means that then um, the field has required to, to learn a whole lot and adapt and, and so I, I'm just deeply appreciative and um, I know that when I have reached out that the staff has just worked incredibly hard to try to be responsive and, and, and thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Wall. Commissioner Hind. Uh, good morning. I had um, a, a friend of mine who's a teacher reach out to me yesterday to ask if I would bring up um, a question regarding the timeline to resign um, from a district. If there's any thought of um, extension without having adverse action taken against that credential holder, if a school district hasn't um, rolled out their plan for how they're going to reopen. And the reason this was brought up, she said, was that um, some people at her school have health issues of their own and are worried about being back in the classroom if a good plan isn't in place. Um, and if the district hasn't unveiled their plan by the June 30th cutoff, and then that teacher decides that the plan is not going to be good for their health, um, then their you know, credential could be in jeopardy. So I don't know if we've thought about that. Um, I don't think we have, but I just figured this would be probably the best time to bring it up since it is COVID-19 related. Uh, Commissioner Brown. Thank you guys. <laughs> I just have to say that in the, um, We've now moved towards um, a complete inclusion of early childhood in the child development permit. 
I'm smiling and thanking all of you, including Terry hanging in there with me when I was sort of the little nagging gadfly all the time. Um, I know that we'll, this will be a big, um, will be a, a bigger presentation tomorrow, um, but it's very exciting to see um, this system um, begin to move in and bridge with the rest of the California public school credentialing system. Thank you. I'll save all my questions for tomorrow. Okay, we look forward to those. Uh, Commissioner Greno Shire. I'm sorry, we have one more public comment when you have a moment. Uh, let's go ahead and move to public comment then, and we'll come back to commissioner comments. Just one moment. Yeah. There's been a change. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt the, the, the I'm sorry, the discussion. No worries. Thank you, Rhonda. Commissioner Greno Shire. Thank you. I just wanted to take this moment to thank um, Executive Director Sandy and her team for all the work they did on um, getting that executive order to the governor's office and um, getting it signed. Um, I don't know how much the commissioners, the other commissioners realize the work and the time and the persistence that it took. Um, the higher ed leads on the commission were in frequent contact with Mary. I, I was worried she was gonna block my cell phone number at some point. So I really appreciate Mary and her team. It, it was a huge, huge lift, so thank you. Here, here. Additional comments. Uh, Executive Director Sandy. Thank you. Thank you all. This has been, um, you know, there are people who in a crisis run for cover and then there are people who in a crisis are trying to figure out what to do. And I'm working with a group of people who are figuring out what to do. And I'm really grateful uh, for that because all of us have, have really wanted to bring whatever relief we could find uh, to, the, to the field um, in this moment. So thank you for, for supporting and recognizing that and the work of the staff has truly been extraordinary. There have been a couple of questions that came up. Commissioner Hind, uh, you raised a question. Um, I can't remember which other commissioner raised a question. Oh, it was one of our public commenters, but specific issues related to uh, deadlines and credentials, et cetera. What I'd like to recommend, since we haven't agendized those specific topics per se, and the staff will need to do some digging to be responsive, is that those questions be submitted to or, or sent in to the commission through one of our um, chat lines or email uh, boxes so that the staff can, uh, can work on a, a complete response response for you. Okay, thank you, Mary. Other commissioner comments? Uh, commissioner Rodriguez? Yes, my, my, uh, mine is more of a, a logistical question um, and it's for Amy Rising. For the uh, EdTPA or any other meetings that um, you'll be having with um, uh, teacher preparation, induction, things of that matter. Are commissioners invited to attend? Would we be welcome? Yes, absolutely. You, you are invited. You're always invited and um, we can make sure that you know about uh, when they are in a timely way so you can plan to be with us. We'd love to. Okay, excellent. Especially the special ed, you know, because that's, that's such a uh, especially what we're going through right now with COVID, we want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our special ed students. Thank you. Thank you for your work. You're welcome. Other commissioner comments? All right. Well, I can uh, also attest to the tremendous work that um, Mary Sandy and her team have been doing over the last several months. And I hope I won't be overstepping when I say that in this constantly evolving environment, no matter what, we are going to seek out and listen to and learn from the field. No matter what, we're gonna keep 
the needs of students at the forefront of our decision making. No matter what, we are going to remain open to change as change happens. And no matter what, we're going to keep working our hardest to support our educator community. And you've already heard how much that's happening. So thank you, <clears throat> Terry and Aaron and Amy for this item. And thank you for all of the detail that you have had in there. Any other comments before we move? Uh, Commissioner Martin. Nice job riffing off of the students there with their poem. I appreciate that. And I hope it gets back to the students that you took a found poem and turned it into one for our work, which is exactly what a commissioner said earlier today. Statements are one thing, action is something else, and taking it to action. And um, the comments that I heard on this item made me re realize I forgot to mention in my opening comments, deep gratitude to the staff and to Mary and her team and everything that you've been leading, you guys have been doing a tremendous job and this is evidence of that. And I meant to say that in my opening comment. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Martin. Okay, before we move to uh, the Educator Preparation Committee, I would just like to announce that we, uh, in the interest of time, have decided to move two additional items to tomorrow. So items 2B and 2D will also move to tomorrow. We already announced at the beginning that 2E would. So just to reiterate, 2B, 2D, and 2E will be moved to tomorrow. Okay. All right. I now recess the general session and move to the Educator Preparation Committee. Commissioner Rodriguez, will you please reconvene the committee? Or convene, sorry, you haven't re been there yes, yet. Yes, I will convene, thank you. Uh, good morning again. Um, I'd like to call the June 2020 meeting of the Educator Preparation Committee to order. We have six agenda items. Two of the items will be presented today. Um, and that is 2A and 2C. And the remaining items will be presented tomorrow morning. I would like to remind members of the public uh, that wish to speak on a specific item to please email your request to comments at CTC. Oh, whoa, disappeared. Comments at ctc.ca.gov or call 916-322-322. 6253 and indicate which item you wish to speak to so we can call your name during the appropriate time. Please make sure the request includes your full name, phone number, if participating through phone only, your affiliation, and the agenda number and title. Make sure the name you provide matches the name used to join the meeting. The meeting host will call your name, unmute your microphone, and allow you to share your comments. After you finish your comment, the microphone will be muted by the meeting host. Um, so we'll start with item 2A. First item is uh, are the potential changes to the accreditation framework. This is an action item um, that will be presented by Cheryl Hickey and Aaron Sullivan. Ms. Hickey, will you please begin? Certainly. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Right. Okay, good morning, commissioners. This agenda item is the proposed changes to the accreditation framework for your consideration today and if you deem appropriate for your adoption. The item was first presented to you at the January 2020 commission meeting when we were all together. Um, for your recollection, this framework is the overarching policy document outlining the commission's accreditation system. And the actual nuts and bolts and processes and procedures of the accreditation system is in another document called the accreditation handbook. That document um, takes the guidance from the commission and turns it into those processes and procedures. And that is adopted by the committee on accreditation who you all appoint. Um, so this framework document includes that broader policy framework and the operational matters are contained in the handbook, but they really go um, really together in order for the system to work. 
You may also recall that the reason we're bringing this item to you at this point in time is because we now have had four years of implementation of the current system um, and we've learned a lot. So we believe that there are changes that need to be made. Um, some, some are tweaks uh, and little adjustments and others are more larger substantive issues such as um, incorporating the major changes that you did over initial institutional approval um, over a course of time last year. We've also been advised that aspects of this accreditation framework should actually be in regulations. And so this is the first step to our next step, which would be to begin the promulgation of regulations. And so those items would come to you as well. Um, at the January 2020 meeting, we did walk through each chapter very carefully and um, deliberately. And the commission discussed each of the areas in which you wanted to see some additional changes. Um, or where we had offered some changes and um, you wanted to see some additional uh, work on that, those changes. After the meeting, we did establish a survey that was advertised widely in our PSDE news. And that PSDE news goes to about 2000 people in the state that are um, educators and educator preparation um, entities. And it was open for about two months. Unfortunately, we only did receive 11 uh, survey respondents in part because it is the framework. It's not the most exciting document in the world, but, um, but those 11 um, comments were very well informed. They were very thoughtful. They had um, a clear understanding of the commission's accreditation system. And so we took a lot of their, um, their suggested changes. They went through um, each chapter word for word um, and they provided us both really good substantive changes as well as some, um, some specific grammatical changes and, and clarity um, kinds of changes. We also discussed this at the February Committee on Accreditation um, um, uh, meeting and they also had a lot of good changes. Um, many of their concerns were about the nuts and bolts and the pieces that need to go in the handbook. Um, so we are kind of putting that in a parking lot and, and when we get to that document soon, we will make those changes for the Committee on Accreditation. So the proposed revised version is presented in a separate link on the Commission's website. Um, it's a Word document and track changes, and you can turn that track changes off by hitting the, um, the um, you know, no markup section. So if you needed to see a clean copy, my understanding is on your secured website, that is a PDF only, so that, that option is not available. Um, there are a lot of changes. Um, so if you prefer to see it in the cleaner version, that's fine. Um, we tried to incorporate all of the suggestions you made in January and we wanted to highlight just some of them today. We won't go into all of them. Um, and, and the charts on pages three through 10 of the item, the second to the right-hand column kind of captures some of the conversations or some of the, the suggestions we had. And then on the column on the far right, we tried to um, summarize some of the bigger changes that we made. Um, we did not call out for you each and every time we made little grammatical changes because that would have been a little unwieldy, but um, for the most part, we wanted to cover that. So I'm going to turn it over to Erin, and she's just going to walk through a couple of major changes in each of the sections. Thank you, Cheryl. Good morning, commissioners. So as Cheryl mentioned, we'll, um, we'll be highlighting a few of the, the more major changes of this. I'm going to walk through uh, some of the larger changes made to the introduction through chapter five, and then I'll turn it back over to Cheryl to cover the remaining chapters and, um, and close out the items. So um, in the introduction, let's start with the introduction. Uh, based on a lively conversation had by commissioners around the graphic uh, that was in the, the previous version and specifically the topic of direct versus indirect measures of learning the graphic on page 2A16 of your appendix was modified. Uh, the revised graphic, we hope, better reflects the structure of the accreditation system. The graphic now illustrates how the standards, which are in the upper right-hand corner, define both outcomes measures and the institutional and programmatic structures as assessed through the accreditation system. So the, the arrow from um, uh, from the standards to both outcomes measures and accreditation. Also, uh, it, it illustrates how the outcomes measures then, including the performance assessment, feed into the accreditation system and how the accreditation system with its components of standards and outcomes measures ultimately results in transparency to the public. 
On the next page of the framework, language was added based on commissioner dialogue to emphasize the importance of having education professionals engaged in the accreditation system, uh, the benefits and strengths that it brings to the system, and also the benefits in terms of what those educators then take away from their interactions with this work. Uh, finally, language was added just in general to, prevent, to reflect some of the feedback from stakeholders uh, in the survey that greater emphasis should be made regarding the commission's role in preparing educators for service in public schools and how the benefits are felt uh, beyond just beginning practitioners. In chapter one, a section was added on page uh, 2A20 about the appointment of a commission liaison to the Committee on Accreditation. And then just below that in number six, language was added to declare the importance of having a knowledgeable, trained and calibrated staff. In chapter two, revisions, revisions were made at the very beginning of the chapter um, in number one to identify the options that are available to institutions in their programs seeking accreditation, which includes alignment to commission adopted standards, national or professional program standards or experimental standards. And those three um, options are then discussed uh, in the following chapter in chapter three. There was some feedback from the stakeholder survey uh, that institutional or program alignment to those three options should be covered in greater detail. And that more detail should be provided about how the accreditation system would be monitored. In the end, staff felt that these details would be better suited to the handbook, which is, as Cheryl mentioned in her opening, the document that really contains the nuts and bolts of the processes that implement the language of the framework. Um, in chapter three, no additional revisions were made. Uh, chapter four, we received feedback from commissioners and stakeholders regarding adding language to clarify uh, questions to be asked at each stage of the IIA process uh, and to ensure that institutions seeking IIA understand that they will be preparing educators to serve in California public schools. Um, uh, in this particular case, staff feels that this clarity can be provided in the IIA process itself and in the um, guiding documents that we give to programs and the questions that we ask programs to respond to. Then in chapter five, commissioners signaled their desire to ensure that there was evidence play, or I'm sorry, em emphasis placed on the use of data by institutions for self-reflection and evaluation for program changes. Um, and revisions were made to this section through the addition of language and also by retaining language that was previously identified by staff for deletion. And uh, Cheryl, now, if you'd like to pick up on chapter six. So chapter six is the section that addresses the Board of Institutional Reviewers. And they are, as you recall, the really important group of folks um, that are um, experts in the field. They are K-12 practitioners as well as educator prep preparers who are across the spectrum of credential areas. And we really rely on them for this peer review system. So this section um, talks about the volunteers. Uh, both the COA and the commission expressed a desire to include more information about the recruitment of BIR members. We've added a paragraph on page 2A40 that discusses the importance of a diverse pool of BIR members. Um, so hopefully that's um, helpful to you in, in response to your concerns. It was going through this chapter that you had a really rich discussion in January about diversity, equity, and inclusion and whether that needs to be called out in the framework. Um, and the conversation at the time concluded with the, the, the discussion um, that that needs to take place at the commission level on a larger, um, more comprehensive manner. Uh, Dr. Standy and Dr. Sloan mentioned that at the beginning in their, in their comments. Um, I just wanted to say here that, that at any point in time, if any of those conversations should impact this document, we certainly could re come back to this document and and continue that conversation and make additional changes here. Um, also, so on chapter seven, this is the section that addressed national and professional accreditation. Um, it's on pages uh, 45 through 47. And this was the section that you all found most confusing um, and rightly so in the currently adopted version. Um, and so at the last meeting, we presented you with a significantly um, edited version of this chapter, what we were still trying to maintain and largely preserve what was in the current framework. 
with your encouragement, we went back to the drawing board to rethink this section um, and we simplified it and we uh, hopefully made it much, much clearer. So this section is now significantly shorter, more concise and um, hopefully clearer. And at your, your suggestion, we removed what you called the what ifs um, and focused on the larger aspects uh, that are involved in acknowledging those institutions that want both national or professional accreditation and seeking commission accreditation. The operational aspects of that, we then will move and have into the accreditation handbook and make sure that it's clear there. And then finally in chapter eight, this is the section that talks about the evaluation of the accreditation system. And that also had garnered a lot of um, discussion from all of you at the last commission meeting or the commission meeting in January. Um, in response to some of the questions that you all raised, we mentioned that the language in the current accreditation framework is really language that reflects a bygone era. Um, and you had made the suggestion that we really just take another look at this. Um, so we have done so, and we've sig significantly rewritten the paragraph at the bottom on page 48 and the top of 49 to reflect current realities, the importance of collaboration, and the inclusion of local education agencies as educator preparers. Um, additionally, we tried to reflect that the accreditation system itself should employ the same type of standard for continuous improvement that it requires of institutions and the programs it monitors. So with that, we're happy to take any questions, can incorporate any additional changes you have to that language. And if you deem appropriate, then um, we could recommend uh, adoption. Thank you. Thank you. We will now open for public comment. Um, do we have any public comment on this item? Yes, we do. Lisa Mosco. She's not present. Thank you. Next is Wendy Zacuto or Zucato. Zacuto. I'm Wendy Zacuto. Zacuto. I'm Can you please Zacuto. state your, your name and affiliation for the record, please? Yes. Thank you so much for the opportunity to address this amazing body. Um, I am representing Speak Up, which is a, a public organization for public schools. I'm inspired by what I've heard today, and I want to add our voices from Speak Up to cultivate educational justice. The quality of special education services provided is defined by the skills and compassion of adults who participate with parents in the allocation of services in public schools. In my work with Speak Up, the voices of my colleagues on the Special Education Task Force have enriched my background as an educator. Hearing their testimonies of participation in district procedures has left me stunned. Their voices and experiences as we work today for their own children and children of those to come have inspired me to come speak with you. As a former LAUSD teacher, former charter school principal and private school principal and teacher, I have seen teachers function in various school environments, including a school for children with moderate to severe disabilities. Partnering with parents in creating a supportive environment for a child is a normal part of the teaching role. We believe that we need to do a better job during teacher credentialing in preparing our teachers to not only participate in more skilled identification of students with disabilities and learning issues, but also to know how to participate in compassionate and collaborative partnering with parents to allow the IEP process to be able to really support all children and to help teachers plan well for the students in their general education classes once these plans are created. We're asking for a little more interplay between the preparation of teachers in special education and general education. This skilled partnership among those who serve our children can only exist if teacher credentialing programs view gen ed teachers as partners in educating students with disabilities and special needs and provide these fledgling teachers opportunities for learning how best to support children and parents who require specialized education. Thank you again for allowing me to talk with you today. 
Thank you. Um, do we have any other public comments? Yes, let's go back to Lisa Moscato. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. Oh, I'm sorry, Moscow, Lisa Moscow. You okay, can you hear me? Yes. Can hear me? Okay, thank you. Good morning. My name is Lisa Mosco, and I'm the parent of two students with learning disabilities in LAUSD. I'm also the Director of Advocacy for Special Education at Speak Up and the Chair of the LAUSD CS CAC. Today, I speak on behalf of Speak Up and of all the parents I work with who struggle with accessing true free and appropriate public education for their special needs kids. According to a study published by the National Center for Educational Outcomes in 2010, over 80% of students with disabilities can achieve at grade level when offered appropriate supports. Right now in LAUSD, only 10% of students with disabilities meet grade level standards. IDEA mandates that the vast majority of these students be included in general education classrooms, yet, General educators are not required by the CTC to have adequate knowledge of special education practices to support these students. From what I understand, the CTC requires all educators to take a course on the US Constitution, but not one that covers the basics of IDEA or best practices for identifying and supporting students with disabilities. The result is terrible frustration on the part of students, teachers, administrators, and parents alike millions of dollars of litigation and SELPAs across the state, and generations of children who've been completely failed by the system. Many students who are never identified in keeping with child find, and those who are, are often stigmatized or left behind by educators who do not have the adequate training to meet their needs or even appreciate their potential. I'd also like to highlight the incredible disproportionality piece here, one that cuts both ways. So many African-American students are misidentified as special education when in fact they do not have any disabilities or neurological differences and others are not identified as having true disabilities that do in fact impact their learning. The most famous example being that of Shonda Smith. This feeds the school to prison pipeline. According to the Bureau of Justice, prison inmates are four times as likely and jail inmates are more than six times as likely to report a cognitive disability than the general population. On average, 13% of students in K through 12 public schools have a disability that impacts their learning. That's over one in 10 kids or over two kids in each classroom. That is a general ed classroom. I urge this commission to involve parent voice more in the accreditation process and framework and to take a closer look at how to truly support and prepare educators, all educators, so that they can meet the urgent needs of our students with disabilities. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Um, do we have any other public comments? Angela Suther Sutherland, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Hi everyone, I'm Angela Sutherland and I'm a parent of a middle schooler who received special education services residential school through the Sacramento City Unified School District. I'm also a co-organizer with the Coalition for Students with Disabilities, a group that formed in 2018, focused on the educational rights of students with disabilities and other disadvantaged students. I want to thank the commission for your efforts in creating a framework that fully prepares general educators to identify and support students with disabilities. I did closely follow the statewide special education task force and felt honored to sit in and give feedback on the subcommittee for educator preparation. But I am unclear on how the common trunk is being incorporated into the current framework. In Sacramento City USD, only 14.9% of students with disabilities are proficient in ELA and 12% in math and fewer than 58% of students with disabilities graduate high school, the lack of access to appropriate supports has led to an overrepresentation of students being sent to separate schools, denying their right to be educated in the least restrictive environment. 
in Sac City USD, there's a major disconnect between general education and special education. Our district has continued to add in special day classes while halting the expansion of inclusive practices and has not met the state performance plan indicators for least restrictive environment. Students with disabilities in Sac City USD are among those with the highest suspension rates in our district and our state. In my district, teacher training is opt-in professional development and often only train the trainer model is used. And this is not adequately developing our teachers. In addition, labor disagreements have prevented the district from implementing meaningful initiatives that would be beneficial to students, such as uh, assessment of students, um, in addition to uh, inclusive practices programs for social and emotional learning, PBIS and restorative practices. Our students can't wait any longer to get the help they need and it's vital because these issues make our student, our schools a breeding ground for segregation, bullying, and disciplinary problems, and the needs go unaddressed for many students. Thank you, and I hope um, to have future collaboration with your commission and to gain a better understanding on how educator preparation has changed as a result of the task force recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sutherland. Do we have any other public comments? The last re public comment request is from Robin Cowan. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. Hi, my name is Robin Cowan. I'm from the Irvine Community Advisory Committee for Special Education. Um, first, I just wanna thank you. I know this is your time and attention. You are all very de dedicated educators and you want to see improvements. And so we as parents want to let you know that we support you and we are appreciative of all your time and attention. Um, secondly, we also wanna support the rest of our educators and make sure that they have the appropriate knowledge and tools to quickly and properly identify students that may need special education services and how to approach it, that communication collaborat collaboratively with parents. Here's where the parent perspective and voice would be very important to incorporate. Incorporate, And my um, question is, would you please consider having parents partner with credentialing programs? Parents can be great advocates on behalf of teachers when they know teachers care. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any more public comments? Hi, Drew or Rhonda? No, we have no further comments. Okay, so um, now that we, uh, we're, we're closing this uh, public comment for this item, uh, commissioners, do you have any comments? And I'll look for your hands, digital hands, and hands with digits. <laughs> Here. Okay, um, Commissioner Grano Shire, will you? Please go ahead. I just wanted um, to ask for a clarification. I'm trying to pull up the file really quickly, but at the end of the track changes word document, I think there is a section missing because there's a sentence that begins and then doesn't end. So I'm just wondering if um, the staff could look at that and clarify, and I'm, I'm trying to pull it up, I'm sorry. I know you're talking about, and that was supposed to be, um, <laughs> the sentence ends with, or the, the last uh, track change that says this periodic review, and it ends there. Um, that was supposed to be stricken so okay. that it was at educational organizations in the state. Thank you for noticing that. That was supposed to be a change. As you can see, there were lots of changes, so it was a little um, crazy to try to keep track of all Thank of them. Thank you.
Let's see, commissioners, any other comments on this item? Commissioner Wall, and then Commissioner Slip. Um, you know, I risk being Pollyannish today. Um, that's not typically my style. Um, but I am just deeply appreciative of the work that went into the revision following the last meeting. I had a chance to review this really carefully. I pulled out all the track changes to read it clean. Um, and I think that it actually, it moved to advance a lot of what we had talked about in our last meeting. Um, I recognize the comments that um, were just made by the public. And I think that they're really important to think about, you know, how the, the framework makes sure to incorporate special education into the general education um, so, so those are something important to, to, to continue to consider. But I think this is a real step forward. I'm, I'm particularly deeply appreciative of the revision in section eight. You had to get all the way to it um, about the continuous improvement focus uh, of um, data gathering. I think that uh, both for institutions and for the commission. Um, so to me, this was a, a really excellent response to the, the really in-depth discussion we had and, um, and I just wanted to note that. Thank you. Commissioner Sloan. Thank you, Commissioner Wall was a good segue. One of my things that I think about often these days is um, the data that we require for accreditation and for accountability and the data programs use for continuous improvement purposes. And, it, and sometimes those data sources are different. And the more uh, that we have been using data and accountability, the more I think programs have come to understand what kind of data has been important for their program improvement purposes um, and what kind versus the kind of data that um, is used in, for reporting purposes. Now, ideally, I think we wanna to get to a place where that data uh, overlaps and integrates uh, better. And I think that is somewhere that the field needs to go because I do also believe that uh, while we want to be sure that we are accrediting programs and ensuring that they are high quality for preparing teachers for kids. Um, we also need to balance that with what is really the essential data that we need to make those decisions because it can be quite onerous on programs uh, at times to put all of this reporting together. So um, that's only to say that um, the framework, uh, I agree with Commissioner Wall, you all have done tremendous work in taking our comments from um, January, taking uh, other comments, your own knowledge and putting it into it. And then there was just um, the piece that you mentioned, Cheryl, that we're all, this is a, a continually evolving document and frame and that as we learn more and focus more on what are the data elements that we need, what are the things that we really need in, in this framework. Um, we heard from some of our parents today of the special education community that all of these things will continue to go into this work, um, which I think is really important. And so sort of on that note, I was just curious, those of you who worked on this, on revising this framework, were there uh, additional questions or insights that you had. I know Cheryl, you mentioned that uh, when you were framing um, the selection of the BIR committee, uh, lots of questions around who they are and, and our, our discussion around equity and access came into play. Were there other things that came up for you all as you were taking our suggestions and making these revisions? I would say, there were there were a lot of um, comments about BIR and who they are and how um, knowledgeable they are, as well as staff. Um, so, sort of emphasized the conversation that you had in January about how important it is that um, the folks that participate are 
are knowledgeable and 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 know what they're doing when it comes and have a good background in education and public education in particular. Um, I'd say the other area. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think, Erin. Can you think of anything else? Um, no, I really appreciated being able to add in um, at, at you know the commissioner's identification of the need for language around the importance of the professional educator's role in the accreditation system, um, and I. If, I'm a little sheepish about having sort of overlooked that um, when we were making the modifications because it's something that I tell these BR, BIR members every time they show up for a program review or a common standards review or a site visit, um, I'm constantly reminding them of the strength of the process because it's a peer review process, how much more meaningful their feedback is. And they are uh, pretty regularly giving us feedback about how great it was to be engaged in this process, how much they learned, the takeaways that they have. Sometimes they see something when they're reading a program and they think, this is really fantastic. I wanna take this back to my program and think about introducing this into my program. So um, I really appreciated being able to add that language in um, at, the, at the behest of the commissioners. The other thing that I would just reiterate what you said, um, Chair Sloan, about data and the importance mm -hmm. of, of really continuing that conversation about what does the data tell us how how good is that data and how what role does it play in the in the decision making process for determining whether an institution has a high quality program or not um you know we, we i think back to when we had biannual reports about i don't know six or seven years ago and the first set of biannual reports we got were all about 100% of our candidates completed this course. And it was really course completion. It was not at, at a level that was anything but superficial. And we have come a long way, I think, in just you know less than a decade, I think, of using performance data to help inform decisions. Where, where are there issues? Where do the candidates have difficulty? And, it, and can we tie that back to an issue of the curriculum and the clinical practice? So, so we have come a long way, but we have a long way to go still. So, um, you know, I think continuing to think about the data and what the data tell us is important. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Commissioner Martin. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a very broad question. I'm going all the way back to the top of the document and forgive me if I'm off topic. First, I'd like to uh, recognize the public comments that were just made about students with disabilities and appreciate those comments. Um, as folks get to know me a little bit, you'll know that a passion for me is special education. That's where how I got into teaching in the first place. My older brother, Charlie, I talk about frequently is developmentally disabled and grew up here in San Diego and San Diego Unified. And um, it's a particular passion. I thought the comments were right on point. Uh, so I appreciate that. And I wanted to go back to the very beginning and have staff talk to me a little bit about the change in, um, it's in the, in the introduction, but I think it might help me understand a little bit more about where it came from, where we added, instead, it used to say, including verifying each candidate who graduates, we changed it to, um, I mean, the first paragraph in the introduction, the last sentence, accreditation refers to the process of identifying and verifying the quality of each program that prepares educators for serving the public schools. And we've added by ensuring that the program meets the state adopted standards in order to ensure that candidates who graduate from the program meet the qualifications for licensure established by the commission. And it used to just say, including verifying that each. I'm guessing that there was a reason behind that change that we've shifted from just verifying to ensuring could staff talk to that change and what's behind it a little bit or somebody's able to comment to that? Or I can tell you what the thinking is here. I, I thought that it misrepresented what the commission does in the accreditation system. By saying that we were verifying each candidate, it made it sound like the accreditation team goes out, we look at every single uh, candidate record, we make sure that they've all completed everything. We do not actually do that. So we look at the processes, procedures, making sure that those are in place. 
that we look at the advising material to make sure it's accurate and timely. We look at a sample of candidate um, information to make sure. We look at the processes for recommending the candidate to the commission, but we do not actually ask for a 100% comprehensive list of each candidate going through the program and where they are and what their individual, you know, by name, by requirements. Um, I don't think we have the capacity to do that, but we do make sure that the systems are in place to make sure that when, a, when an, an educator preparation program recommends that that candidate has completed everything. So that it was just, I felt like it was just stretching, it just wasn't the appropriate language to use and that this one more accurately represents what we do. Okay, that's what I was um, guessing, but I didn't want to guess at it. And I want, and I thought I know that so much thought has been put into this, and I'm appreciative of it. So I wanted to give you the ability to explain what was behind it, and I, that was ex extremely helpful. The next paragraph kind of does the same thing. You change the word "assure" to "ensure." As a former literacy specialist, that I know words matter, and these are really important changes that help reflect the work that I believe uh, you want it to be as reflective of what you're actually doing and not have it overstate or understate what the work is. So appreciate it. If, I don't know if you want to mention something about that as well, or if you've said it all already. No, that's exact. I mean, that's exactly it. We were, we were really trying to be as careful as we could with the language and very precise. So I appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Commissioners, um, any other comments on this item? Commissioner Slim. Um, thank you. Two things did uh, come up. One was, um, I think it was something that uh, one of you, Aaron or Cheryl, was talking about um, in practices. Oh, it was with respect to um, the, our BIR and the peer review process and the fact that part of the advantage to that peer review process is that peers get a chance to see practice and other programs and design and et cetera, and it informs the whole field's work. Mm -hmm. And over time, we have talked about, are there ways that we can identify high quality or best practices or even accredit programs in a different way that identifies them in some way that can help others learn. And I, I don't know where we are anymore in that conversation. So I was just curious. Um, and Aaron might wanna jump in too, but you did ask the same question in January. So I know it's, it's hot on your list. We do have that on our work plan for this year. Um, we have spent lots of time talking about it with the Committee on Accreditation. Um, there has been a lot of concern about how do you determine a fair system for identify if you're going to call something out how do you identify a very fair and equitable system for doing that mm -hmm. um, so we um we did come up with a process about a year and a half ago and we have not never been able to implement that process um, we will revisit that for sh for sure this this year so we will we'll make sure that that is on the list um, we had the system that we had developed was sort of outside of the accreditation system. Um, we had developed sort of a system that would say you can't you can't be considered unless all your standards were met and that kind of thing. Um, but it was kind of sat outside of the accreditation system. Uh, we will revisit that this year and bring you back some information on that for sure and have you weigh in on that. Erin, do you want to add anything to that? No, not no, not particularly. I mean, it's something that we've spent a lot of time talking about, for sure. Um, and as with many things, this spring got a little sidetracked with COVID. I, I think that doesn't even need to be stated. But, you know, we did have something and we were really, I think, kind of doing a deep dive on what's the kernel, um, because there are so many unique aspects to programs. Mm -hmm. um, and that is because California, I think, is, is a big state with an incredibly diverse population and programs in different regions uh, are doing what they need to do to best address the needs of their local students and prepare their candidates. And so it's, I think, the thinking around what's the, what is the kernel then once you get through all of that uniqueness, the necessary uniqueness, what's the kernel then? Um, of excellence at the core of the programs. And that's a pretty big question. <laughs> okay, appreciate that. One last quick question. 
I hope um, as you, again, sort of looking at you all who have been doing this work and now we are in this time in the, the section on site visits and there's focus sites visits and then there are your, your site visits that happen during your cycle. Um, have people been talking about um, the difference between in-person site visits and virtual site visits? And I just wonder what uh, do we gain by in-person site visits uh, have, do you have insights in that? Do we do we need to have in in person site visits? Um, Cheryl, do you want me to go ahead? You can start. address that. So we've gotten a, a lot of feedback, and I think it's kind of across the board. Um, we have had some people come off of these virtual site visits and contact us and say, "This was so great for me. I was really able to fit this into." Um, you know, the rest of my very busy work life schedule and, you know, any other virtual visits, I'm happy to do multiple visits in the year if I can always do them virtually. The flip side of that are the people that come back from these visits and say, I did not like not being able to be in a room with people. Um, and I think as we're all looking at each other on these, you know, very small windows, even right now, um, we recognize that there's some body language that can sometimes be missed. So if you're interviewing a group of 25 or 30 people, um, depending on the monitor you're using, how many are you actually seeing on your screen? If you're moving back and forth between screens um, and if some people are calling in because they don't have video, are you missing, for instance, when one candidate says, this thing that the program did for me, this, this aspect of the program was so fantastic. Are you missing perhaps the person over in the corner who might be rolling their eyes as if saying, well, I didn't quite have that experience. And, and that's something that we want our reviewers, we train them to notice that and to tease out those, um, those moments. And so, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's hard to weigh, but I think in general, um, most people prefer being able to be there in person. And I would just say that this year when COVID hit, um, we were really starting the, the hard part of the year in terms of the site visits. So we did um, almost half of our visits this year through a virtual form. Um, and it, when there are no red flags, when there are no issues, these visits can be done pretty easily, but you don't always know that. And it's when you find that institutions have issues where the virtual aspect of it becomes really difficult. The team, just the team conversation and the team's deliberation, trying to figure things out um, is, is a little bit harder and trying to tease out what the issues actually are is a little bit harder than you know, being able to be in a room together. Um, you know, so, so we don't always know what those red flags are until we actually get started on the accreditation site visit. There may be nothing that shows up prior to that. Um, so, so that's the challenge, I think. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have any other comments? See, I'm scrolling through here. This is the, um, the waiting period, the waiting time, different on Zoom. Okay, so I don't see any digital hands or hands with digits. Commissioner Rodriguez. Okay, yes, Erin. Yeah. I, I just, and I don't want to, if there is a commissioner out there with their hand up and we're not seeing that, please don't let me interrupt. But I, I didn't want the item to close without acknowledging the public comment um, be, because it's hard, again, when you're virtual, I don't know if they're seeing us nod our head and writing notes and things. So I just wanted to uh, be sure to, um, as staff, to acknowledge uh, that we heard the comments. And I just wanna provide a little bit of quick clarification that the accreditation framework, it governs the commission's accreditation system, um, which is the system that approves the educator preparation programs and then monitors the programs. The specifics that were brought up in many of today's public comments are really specific to, um, to the standards, to special education and or general education teacher preparation um, and they're, they're, they're outside the area of the accreditation framework. That does not mean that they're not important issues and that staff didn't hear them. They just, they're just outside sort of this conversation. And, and, but I wanted to acknowledge the public comments. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. 
And um, absolutely, if uh, our the, the current commissioners, our leadership at the commission, um, you know, we definitely uh, have had those discussions and those are issues that are important to us. So thank you, um, Ms. Sullivan, for, for commenting on that. Uh, commissioners, any other comments? Commissioner Francois. Uh, thank you. I don't really have a comment. I have a question. Um, I appreciated the uh, surfacing of the composition of the Board of Institution Review that comes out in this document. And I'm just wondering if we have any data to demonstrate if we have been successful in uh, the BIR representing a pool that is diverse based on race, ethnicity, sexual identification, sexual orientation, and state geographical area. Given the opening of this meeting at nine o'clock this morning, I think that our understanding of who who's making up um, the groups that are representing and supporting the work of the CTC matters. And so my question, I guess, I don't know who this question is for. Um, what is the data that we have that says we've been successful in diversifying the, BI, the BIR? And if we have not been, I would propose that we have some, co some conversation perhaps at another meeting about what actions we can take to do so. And I guess I would um, say that historically what we've collected is information about expertise. And obviously we know, you know where, an, where a person is employed. So we know what kind of system they come from, whether they're you know, a UC or a CSU or a K-12. We have not done a good job of, of collecting the other data, and we certainly could talk about that and get and, and move forward on that. I think that would be a very good suggestion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Sloan? I think Commissioner Francois's uh, question is precisely what uh, we need to be thinking about in every single one of our agenda items from now on. We should always have been thinking about this, but let's see if we can get, we can start asking these questions mm -hmm. so that each of the things that we do can start focusing on the kinds of things that we need to focus on. Okay. Commissioners, any other questions or comments? All right, so this is an action item uh, do I have a motion to accept the proposed modifications to the accreditation framework? Commissioner Sloan? I move to accept the proposed modifications to the accreditation framework. Excellent, thank you. Do we have a second? Commissioner Marks? Okay, so we have a motion on the floor and a second. Um, any further discussion, commissioners? Okay, seeing no hands, we'll go ahead and call for a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. And um, Haiju, I believe we'll have a roll call vote, correct? Yes. Kristen okay. Barnes? Aye. C. Michael Cooney? Aye. Marisol Territorio Escobedo? Aye. Johanna Hawick? Aye. Alicia Hine? Aye. Terry Jackson? Aye. Kevin Kuhn? Aye. Jane Marks? Aye. Cynthia Martin? Aye. Monica Martinez? Aye. Ade Rodriguez? Aye. David Simmons? Aye. Tina Sloan? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. So we will continue after lunch with item 2C, we're going to take a half an hour break. It's 12.07 right now. We'll pretend it's 12.10.
so we can come back at 1240. All right, and, um, and then we'll continue with 2C, uh, then we'll go into closed session. Correct? Yes, okay. All right, see you in a little bit, 1240.